Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Hello, hello. Hey. So I think we got um, the live streaming actually working this time. So this should record in a higher resolution. Um, and we've got a pretty packed day today. Okay, so maybe first off, uh, we should, I should share my screen and just sort of give you a little run through. Um, I wanna make sure that everyone has access through Miro board to the uploaded content that we put for Grasshopper. So let me go ahead and switch over screens. Okay, let's see, can everybody see my screen? Cool, great. All right, so while we're giving ch a chance for people to kind of like come in here, uh, I just wanna make sure that we're all good. So if you haven't noticed already, um, under the mirror board that we that Paul provided in the email, there is a Google Drive link. When you click on that Google Google Drive link, it should take you immediately over to the workshops Google Drive, which um, we intend to keep up for quite a while, but you should still grab yourself duplicates. Um, of course, with Google Drive, you should have access to download everything with this link. If you have any problems, please let us know. Um, Andy, for those who like stuck around yesterday to learn how to do the plugin, it's in that same location. So the plugins are at the top. And then under workshop day two is where you're going to see three folders. Those three folders, if you wouldn't mind downloading this entire, or either the three folders individually, or you can download the entire day's folders. This is in each folder, a combination of Rhino um, and a Grasshopper file. Now there is only two Rhino files because we had a request um, by one of the participants to uh, down save to Rhino 6. So you'll see that there is one that under, that has an underscore after the date for Rhino 6, and that is uh, just a duplicate of the Rhino 7 version that is unlabeled or unspecified. And the same should be true for pretty much the, it's the image to curves, toolpath creation, and toolpath examples. Um, to keep things really clean, we have one Rhino file that's always named the same as the Grasshopper file. That way there's never a confusion about which Grasshopper file is sort of like already has sort of like preset geometry from which, um, you know, the Rhino to Grasshopper files. It doesn't, well, however, we have both Rhino files are registered and you can copy content from any of the Rhino files we're providing into any other Rhino file and everything should be scaled and everything's good. So give you, I'll give everyone a chance to sort of get that downloaded. And while that's happening, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get this going here. Let me stop sharing for a second. Does anyone have any problems accessing the Google Drive or getting any of the content from Google? Great. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and share again. Okay, so you should be seeing kind of the presentation in full screen here. Now for, I guess on the topic of like accessing the files, um, if in, when we upload these videos or in the case of like after this is done live streaming, we're gonna, we have links that we're putting in the descriptions that we're gonna link basically back to the same content. So if you know anyone or have anyone who's been auditing um, and wants access to this information, um, we're kind of putting that all through our YouTube channel. All right, so today, our entire focus today is gonna be on fitting as much in as we can about the cons design considerations related to um, toolpaths. Generally speaking, toolpaths um, follow many of the same logics. Um, our approach may be slightly different. So we want to, we're going to just kind of like take it from the ground up and consider that nobody's really done too much with them. Um, that said, 
there are some specific things for biogels. So pretty much everything in terms of spacing and um, uh, pretty much most of the things that we're going to be discussing are specific to how we use the same point, like how we extrude the same formula of base biogel that we did yesterday. Um, I did actually want to give an opportunity. Was there any like um, existing questions or anything that anyone wanted to bring up in general before we sort of launch into today's work? Okay, cool. All right, let's get into it. So our goals for today, we have, we, <laughs> we understand that we have probably about twice as much to teach as we have time for. Um, we know though that there's a condensed workshop. So essentially the, the concept behind here is that we're providing you all the grasshopper and rhino files so that that way, um, as we go through them, anyone who has pre-existing rhino and grasshopper experience may be able to already start to decipher the functions. We're not going to be building any of these grasshopper files from scratch as a live demo, as that would take far longer than what we have time for. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick overview and survey of how each of these grasshopper files work. We have labeled to the best of our ability chunks of components and what they're doing. And we're going to review some of the different methods for using planar, non-planar, um, single curves, multiple curves, and then an example of image to curve. So first we're going to do a quick, I'm going to go through a quick presentation on just sort of like you have a visualization for what the topics we're considering in toolpaths, maybe share some sort of um, vocabulary so that we can sort of communicate um, to the best of our ability so that you all understand. Uh, there is a Rhino file that has like manual versions of toolpaths, and that's what I'm going to review while we're doing this design considerations presentation. After that, we're going to take a short break and then jump over to a grasshopper method for image to curves with Andy. And then Andy and I will be going through the grasshopper file who's, that's essentially responsible for taking any curve, whether that's done by hand or done through an automated process and having that be processed into target planes that can be used by pretty much most, um, I, I would say almost like a, they could be altered in any way to be used um, for most machinery. In this case, we're gonna be showing you how to use G-code as G-code is a language that we're using to operate the Prusa. Uh, oh, and one thing that is missing from here is part of that G-code section. Andy's also has a short presentation to sort of like give a summary overview of the hardware that that G-code is uh, working to work with. Andy, did I miss anything? I'm gonna close this window really quick. No, I think that's uh, that's the game plan for the day. Okay, great. Uh, now there is one last thing that I want to say here, which is that we have a session scheduled for Wednesday. Wednesday session is, is currently um, sort of titled as a support session. That was sort of a catch all for us. If there is content here that you were like looking forward to learning that we just didn't have a chance to cover, or you need some sort of like further explanation or a deeper dive or a different methodology that you want to explore, that will be the opportunity for us to do that. So please, at any point during this presentation, put like a hands up or just go ahead and like jump in on the call and, or, you know, and interrupt because we would love to know what you're particularly trying to get after um, or interested in. And then that way during the support session, if we need to spend, if we need to offer a section of that for further explanations of grasshopper definitions or, or added content, we can do that in addition to individual support sessions. All right. so. From a conceptual standpoint, we are making the primary argument that um, the, the motion that, are, that any sort of equipment takes, in this case, this presentation is gonna show a lot of robotics, but the same is true for gantries. The primary difference between your sort of desktop 3D printer versus a robot, I mean, there's a lot of differences, but maybe we can summarize it for the point of this presentation as three axis versus six axis. <laughs> in either case, Essentially, what we're saying is there's an X, Y, Z motion movement at the very least. Robotics have three additional. But in concept, the tool pathing is very similar in that the extrusion process that comes out is based off of some sort of like predefined motion planning. Now, that motion sometimes, um, or most commonly, is the byproduct of using like a third party software that would slice up a three dimensional object into 
uh, contour layers. And that is primarily the method that um, your desktop 3D printers are going to use and primarily the method that actually um, most G-code based generated um, toolpaths would be made. Now it's very convenient and it works really well. And the, the more resolute or the uh, finer the resolution, the less we're going to be seeing these horizontal contours. But it is worth noting that one conceptual argument for us is that the motion of the robot as it becomes indexed in the material and the surface texture that becomes the byproduct of that actually has a um, pretty profound um, effect on, let's just say, the overall aesthetic of the thing that we're making. So in this particular case on the far left, we can see that these horizontal contours, which are indexing and artifacts of the motion, um, that's why they're all these stacked layers. In the middle here, we have uh, an example from branch technology from years back when they were first doing this like loose lattice structure, where we understand that in this case, the robotic motion is producing this like loose open frame system. Um, in part, uh, the motion is far more complex because it's increasing and decreasing speed and time to allow the plastic as it extrudes to harden to a point that you're able for it able to be self-standing. Um, but from an aesthetic point of view, we can go all the way to the right, which is primarily something you would see. Uh, this is an example from the Bartlett years back um, on their explorations into producing new chairs. Um, you can see here that in this particular instance, that sort of like um, lattice structure, and there's a mass amount of variability that comes back, that comes through this layering process where the robotic motions artifacts are like clearly heavily influencing this aesthetic of like controlled to loose regions where we could start to make an argument that the robotic motion in combination with the material itself and the overall design all come together into something that is designed from the ground up. Here's just another example of the three chairs, and we can see the heavy impact and influence of what these types of motions can produce and how they dramatically affect our perceptions and the reading of the object that they produce. So in summary, just the quick argument here that we believe I um, mean, what how we've been basing this workshop and our work off of is that when producing or designing some object that's using technology and material, it is imperative that we not just customize the material and explore that kind of um, level of control from a performance standpoint, as well as an aesthetic one, but to also control the mechanical or manual or whatever, or workflows, and to really assess what artifacts come out of the processes that we use and to consider how those can be utilized to, um, to enhance and deepen uh, the translation of the object from digital space into our physical world. Now, there have been explorations that have certainly come out of this. Um, oh, and by the way, I see some chats. Andy, you got, oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is clay that's being extruded. Um, this was just like some interesting earlier explorations uh, by Jenny Savin in, in her studio in the Cornell. These were initial explorations to determine how like the way that motion pathing can influence different like densities, patterns, and layering processes. In some cases, these like loose spaghetti noodles <laughs> maybe aren't quite as precise as we're, we're looking for, but the exploration um, is still very valid. Uh, in, it's a, in its influence and what we're looking for. Now, taking this a, a step further, um, this was from a course I taught in the robot lab at SciArc years back, um, but it was essentially considering how if you take a, in this case, this was a PLA thermo extruded plastic. So while not the same materials, the biomaterials we're looking at, the logic is still the same, which is that we get different performance, not just out of the material itself, but the way that the material is deployed into the geometries that make up the end, the end piece. And in this case, there was testing how um, this sort of like repeated chevron pattern um, in a semi, so we call this like a two and a half D sort of like printing style can produce a controlled, um, a controlled motion in particular uh, ways. Now, regardless of whether or not you're working on a robot or working on a gantry system, and um, the way that we work in Grasshopper is that we like to use curves as a way to design and to start to anticipate how what we're gonna make um, 
is going to is going to up here, let's say. We know that there's a translation that's going to happen between the curve as it gets translated into actual target points for the gantry or the robot. Um, we're calling these in this case like target planes or target points that make up the toolpath. But in this particular example, I just wanted to point out that though we may start with curves, ultimately those curves have to be translated into particular target points or locations in space that the machinery understands how to access. Now, while it's true, while there are many different types of settings that, that can control the method through which like a robot moves from point to point or a machine moves from point to point, for our purposes now, it's best to consider that all things are gonna move in straight lines, which means that, uh, sorry, I'm, I gotta be honest, it's been a while since I've drawn on, <laughs> drawn on Zoom. There's like an arc to it. <laughs> but, but in the event that you're trying to make something like, let's say an arced pattern, the arced pattern ultimately will be translated into particular points. If those points are spaced in the way that you see the, the pink, uh, little like lines as I put them. Though we may see the curve as something that's arcing, what's actually going to happen is as the as the apparatus of the toolpath moves in straight lines between each point, this is going to become like a faceted outcome. So many of the things that we're going to be talking about during this process is how do we maintain resolution to get the type of curvature that's necessary without adding so many points that we end up with toolpaths with thousands and thousands of points in order to articulate that arc. Now, I wanna mention, like I just said, I know very well that there are other, there are methods through G-code and there are methods through the way that you can like set up and control your own robotic interfaces if that's something that you have that would in, like interpret things like arcs differently. Um, like you wouldn't necessarily need to go in straight, you know, you wouldn't need to necessarily break a circle like this up into location points and then attempt to connect them through straight motion. But there are methods out there where you would pick like a center radii and then tell the machine to move in an arc along that radius. And there are methods for doing that. So just again, to be clear, uh, we're, we're going to follow one path <laughs> where we consider that the motion between target points is always in a straight line. That straight line can take the place in, in Z or X and Y. Now, in this particular case, that example was sort of like an inverse system where we had um, the robot was holding a flat platform. What's in gray was an industrial extruder. So basically, it was like the extruder stays still and the robot moves. If you're using like a desktop 3D printer, that's obviously the opposite of the case. And it's also would be opposite the case if you were to have you would have a system where your extruder is either mounted to the robot or the extruder has a hose that is mounted to the robot. In either case, though, that's a motion planning difference that is not necessarily a difference in the way that you would need to design the actual toolpath. This would be just like a simulation example of something where students were using. Um, Oh, and it's I'm I'm losing this. This is a um, diffusion reaction <laughs> uh, that's just like essentially taking a surface. In this particular case, they use that methodology to produce sort of like an interstitching between where the toolpath motion itself creates this zipper effect. Um, oh, you can't see my mouse, can you? So let me. Oh, you can. Oh, great, perfect. Okay, great. So much easier. Uh, anyway, the zipper effect so that when you, um, uh, so in this case, it's not just an aesthetic thing uh, and it's not performance in the sense of like controlling motion, but it's the tool path itself was a method for assembling multiple pieces after they had been printed independently. Um, so that is just another argument for highly controlled tool path motion. So one of the topics that happens when you're designing a toolpath isn't just necessarily the path that the, that the um, extruder is going to take, but it also has to do with how we're dealing with the sequencing and the layering. So just to run through some quick terminology, uh, I will just call this like a brief survey of how we might classify some of these different um, outcomes. We would consider this 
a single material, so a mono material. So it's all one biopolymer in this case that's um that's black, uh, made with a particular formula and recipe, and it's printed in a single layer. This single single layer can be added in complexity, which is an example we've shown before, where we take the same logic, only in this case we introduce a gradient, um, which can take on the take on staying the same material, but just altering the color. And then you have instances where we say the same layer and we take the same material with different color gradients, but we change the way that we produce the tool path to create a radial pattern printing as opposed to linear pattern printing. Now to add complexity to that, we can take the same logics of the single material or the single material with color and start to produce multiple layers by taking the same um, toolpath layer and let's say, let's for, for now, stacking it in Rhino and printing to get thicker 3D prints. And following the same logics, only this time introducing color grading uh, to the toolpath as a means for sequencing um, color gradients in tests as well with multi-material paths. Now to break that down, um, this is something that um, I want to clarify is that when we're talking about like multi-material, um, this is an expanded view, but the toolpath in this particular case that was just printing the examples prior were actually the same pattern that was duplicated and stacked on top of itself in three layers, in which case all what we did was we took it and shifted them. Um, if this is if this is about four millimeters spacing, um, so these are four millimeter offsets. We shifted about two millimeters. So the kind of layers would stack almost like bricks in the way that the next layer would print across the um, the seam line of horizontal lines. So if that's not clear, I think it'll be a little clearer in, in a couple more slides. Um, but something that's worth noting is that in the Rhino file, these examples I provided as actual polylines so that you can reference this file for yourself. You'll notice that in these examples, and we're going to talk about this later, these are all single curves. The grasshop, and by single curves, I mean it is a polyline made of like many, many lines that have all been joined together such that there is a single polyline start and a single end. And that that way, the like when this becomes converted into target points, those target points are ordered along the curve. So in this case, it's not just that the polyline start and end becomes a way to maybe let's just say more easily break up this curve into target points, but it also becomes the way that this is sequenced. So we know that as we go through the actual process of converting these, which is the grasshopper definition we're gonna discuss soon, it's going to follow uh, the, or the order of the motion is going to be based off of the order um, as the points occur onto this single polyline. Now, this over here in the middle is a quick example of a double layer. So this is the pattern. We kind of split it up and we stuck the pattern four millimeters on top of itself, noticing that because we still want to maintain one curve in this example, there's actually a little travel that goes and connects the bottom layer to the upper layer. Now, in this case, beside the fact that it's like printing something horizontally and that the pattern is designed, it actually is very similar logic to how you would contour print, um, only in this in the sense that it's like layers that are stacked on top of each other, each layer connected at one location. Um, and when it connects, that means that the polyline start is here. It would track, it would come all the way to this side on the first lower purple layer move up the travel path onto the dark purple layer, and then it would conclude in the middle over here at the end. Okay, so that's just a clarification of what's actually happening in this slide here. Now this methodology produ it easily produces outcomes that are already fairly significant <laughs> in how much um, complexity that that like material sample can have. Um, and then also it is worth also noting that for the scope of this workshop, we're working in say, say pseudo flat sheets, um, but these logics can still be used to produce three-dimensional um, objects. Uh, usually you may need like support structures, like in some sort of substructure, 
but it's totally possible. We do it a lot. Um, but just to keep things sort of like clear and narrow down what we're teaching, everything is going to be some, our expected outcomes are things that look similar to what you see here for the time uh, being. Kyle wants to know why we should be using three layers. And that's mostly for strength. Um, if these lines are all just kind of on their own, then as they dry, then they're a lot more likely to tear each other, tear themselves apart. Um, but if you have three layers, you have enough kind of overlap uh, that it, it, it helps prevent that. Kind of like a, a larger scale of what Garrett was talking about yesterday with the fibers kind of connecting. This, like, if your tool paths are also connecting on a larger scale, it's going to give it a lot more strength. Yeah, that's a, that's actually a really good question. And just for anyone who's a little unclear about what we're what we're talking about right now, um, like, if we imagine that our tool path is sort of like this pink line that's, let's just say, making like a, a somewhat hatching pattern, um, at any time that we're making a tool path and printing, or extruding anything, the weak point is going to be the horizontal locations between layers. So I guess like what I'm saying is that um, it's going to be the weak points going to be along here, where these things will like kind of like delaminate apart. You can almost imagine like tearing apart chopsticks or <laughs> I don't know. It's like it's kind of like these long these and mostly it's because the pressure of the machine is applying pressure downward. So when layers stack on top of each other, um, I guess what we could say is like, if this is our bed that's here in this, in this particular example, the force that's being applied as the material is exiting the extruder is downward. So what's happening is that that material contact onto the material layer that happened before is gonna be incredibly strong. But because we're laying layers next to each other, where they touch each other along the side doesn't have the equal amount of pressure. Now, on the one hand, these horizontal, let's call them um, joints, rely on the material itself to be able to fuse with itself. And that's part of why we gave you that particular formula. But to Andy's point, even when you do one layer, those become weak spots. So in order to mitigate that, um, we have always used multiple layers um, that let's just say cross over those other layers to reinforce the weak points that's running horizontally along the length of, uh, of extrusion. Now, this is a conceptual diagram, but it can take the aesthetic form <laughs> in a number of different ways. Sometimes it's just shifting. Sometimes it's like having a second layer that actually, um, in the instance like what I showed before, where we offset it two millimeters so that the second layer would actually land over the seam lines that we're concerned about, and then deviate, let's say, into this like uh, semi-diagonal piece. And in this case, you get like a like a 30, 60 degree kind of like shift in the patterning if you were to print what you see here, um, which would be interpreted as pink as the first layer and green printed as the second layer above it. Does that does that uh, address the question? <laughs> okay, we're gonna assume yes then. <laughs> All right. Um. So, uh, and it's also worth noting we're not saying that you have to do three layers. Um, in, in, in fact, actually over here on the right, I think there's something like seven or eight layers. Um, this was just a few layers to, to indicate like, basically give you like an expanded view of what this could look like. Um, depending on the material that you make, like let's say, as, as Andy just brought up, we discussed yesterday that fiber um, infused biopolymer is significantly more robust in strength than than you know biopolymer that doesn't have fiber so it may be that if you did one layer in fiber and then a second layer without fiber um, that may be strong enough with just those two layers um, but that's kind of where like this testing comes in and part of the reason that we like to make these files digitally and be able to use 3d printers to print them is so that we can have repeatable testing so it may be that like you run a toolpath one day with one with material type A and you run a tool, the same toolpath with material type B and C. And then when it's all done, 
you know that the strength of the piece that you have is of is um different because of the material and not different because of the way that the material was deployed and the patterning that it was uh that it was deployed with okay cool thank you for uh jumping in there andy so now we're not saying you have to do this but again just more ways that you can expand this is something that we brought up yesterday but um using multi layers and multi material so like uh, the scope of this course is biopolymer but that doesn't mean that these logics couldn't expand into other material research or material research that would use in combination with biopolymers and that's what this project is an example of the way that you design these tool paths in this case this was all kind of like drawn um, this is an image that was well you could achieve this by tracing an image and using the offset function to sort of get like horizontal lines in the way that we need and in this case the um black and the the tan are different colors. So as we showed yesterday, the ceramic was 3D printed and became the substructure. And this itself was made of two layers that were stacked on top of each other and printed with the same extruder that then went back and printed the um, biopolymer over it using an additional three layers. Now you can start combining ideas. So this is an outcome that actually Andy did. Um, this would be multi-layer, multi-material, and color. <laughs> so you kind of have like three things that are going on at once. However, I do want to point out, this was an in-progress print. Um, when we're speaking about like areas that we don't think, or, or we might be somewhat concerned about not successfully printing well, or our drawing well would be areas like this, where there isn't like an adhesion between layers, like these openings are not going to like, well, we don't want to make all generalizations, but I would say usually this would be a point <laughs> that the piece would fall apart. And so over in this region, this is an example where you can see multiple crosshatch layers where it came out really well. <laughs> um, and in the event that you wanted to produce something that was like, let's say this loose in its, um, its patterning, we actually have found out after we did this that a really good method is to produce a base clear and actually just like lay down a whole clear sheet. And then while it's still wet, print this on top and they all fuse together into like a single sheet material where your patterning may look like line work like this, but the actual material itself is a single sheet. So we could interpret this white underneath, although it's not. But we would suggest if you wanted to do something like a pattern like this, that you would put an all white layer first or an all clear layer first and then print on top. Although the biomaterial in this instance is, is stacking on top of itself and making sort of like clear layers uh, horizontally, like you can see very clearly that there are two layers where I put that blue or red arrow. Um, when it when it dries, the, the formula is designed to sort of like, let's say self-level to a certain degree where you're gonna get this as more of a smooth continuous sheet. Okay, so moving on. Uh, here's an example of that. Um, so yeah, as you can see, uh, referring to like where the weakest points of a print are gonna be, that's gonna definitely be like right between these two layers that are being printed, the seam line. And you can easily see it's because the extruder is pushing the material down to the layer, to the surface below or the layer below, but not pushing it horizontally inward, which is why we need to make sure that the spacing between the tool path will ensure that horizontal aligned layers come in full contact with each other and that there's no white space or gap between those layers. And for that reason, the diameter of the nozzle becomes what dictates the spacing between the horizontal tool paths. So in this particular case, our nozzle that we're using, Andy, is it a 4.5 millimeter nozzle? Can't remember. Yes. Okay, so the nozzle that we're using is four and a half millimeters in diameter. So that is why we are saying to make your when we make tool paths, these tool paths will be designed 
in a way where their center lines are four millimeters apart. So we ensure that there's a half a millimeter, well, yeah, there's like a half a millimeter zone of overlap <laughs> where the two, the two um, extrusions will come in direct contact with each other. Does that, uh, does that explanation not, if, let me know if that's something that I need to go into further detail about. Uh, maybe one way to just ensure if there's anyone that has confusion, if I were to redraw, let's say a tool path over here in the corner, we'll draw this simple tool path again, which is just like going to be like a straight three lines printed in one area and two lines printed in another. The easiest way to sort of simulate or imagine this is that the diameter of your of your um, extruder, whatever that is, is going to be on the center of your toolpath. So that would sit something like this here, and it would travel along that toolpath. So if that is a four millimeter, uh, sorry, four and a half millimeter diameter, our next four and a half millimeter would run here, and they will intentionally overlap each other. Oh, of course it won't let me. Yeah, they'll intentionally overlap each other and touch each other when they print next to each other. Because it's it's gel-based, that like overlap will just be absorbed into the material. It's not going to be something that you can like, it's not a bulge that you can see. So um, part of what we continued working on and one of the grasshopper definitions is gonna show you the ability to sort of like start to preview color distribution. And that's for the purpose of being able to start to consider how you can have multi-material or multi-layers that are zoned. So for comparison's sake, in previous examples here, this is all essentially just the same sort of like rectilinear exterior that's stacked on top of each other. And when that gets printed, that gets printed very, you know, it produces something like that you'll see here in gray, with like many of these layers stacked. Now, for a multi-material print where you start to control regions that are going to have different performance or different color, what you might want you'll what you'll end up wanting to do is produce layers that happen in sections. Now, this was a design choice. Like these, this could take on many different <laughs> uh, different kind of layers. But if you break down this toolpath. These are the four layers that were printed in that example. And you can see how, although in this yellow version, there are giant white zones, when it's printed on top of this blue layer, a lot of those zones will be covered. And by the time you're fully done, the 3D, the print itself, which this is the result, becomes something that's all continuous because there is no gaps, even if each individual layer has gaps. Please let me know if that is was not a clear explanation. <laughs> okay, so this, um, uh, this, oh yeah, uh huh. I was asking again, how do we know which parts of the first layer uh, are weak and need to be strengthened with another layer? Yeah, that is a good question. In my experience, um, if you you should always be dubious if you're just printing one layer that there's probably going to be issues where it's not going to be strong enough. I would say that by the time you're done printing, um, and again, this is a great example of how each layer doesn't need to cover the entire piece, but when all layers are printed on top of each other, there's at least two layers of biopolymer everywhere. <laughs> That's kind of like the goal. In this particular example, there's actually areas um, where you can see that there's only one layer. So like, um, this zone here is actually only one layer, but these zones up over here are actually more like three layers or four layers. Now, in if you were to use this with like pulp, uh, those layers that have three or four layers would probably be really rigid, and the other layers would probably like these single layers. If it was printed with like a non-fiber based biopolymer, might be really flexible and weaker. So your question is complex because one, it would be what is that single layer's material made of? If it's a if it's a biogel that has um, fiber, there's a really strong chance that like one layer will do pretty good. Two layers would definitely be the best. 
Um, but if you don't have fiber in it, it may require like three layers. But again, the one thing that we're most concerned about, um, and it's funny because this is a great example, this, this team didn't actually have their toolpath touch each other. <laughs> it's funny, what, what you're looking at here um, is that the team spent a lot of time ensuring that the toolpath, like this toolpath is kind of making like a, uh, a series of motions like this. It's like going back and forth into wiggles. And the same thing was happening here where this one would go into wiggles, but they didn't ensure that the final end, those wiggles are actually not touching each other. <laughs> so there are these like horizontal gaps. In this particular piece, we had to go back um, with a, like after it was printed, we had to go back with a syringe of clear and we had to fill in these gaps. Otherwise when drawing this piece would have like torn it part itself into like long strips right along where like the pieces didn't touch. Um, I know that's a roundabout way and not a, as much of a direct answer as you want. I think, um, so um, I guess let me know if you wanna further expand on that. Um, but I would say, let's just for the purpose of like starting somewhere consistent, you're always trying to have at least two layers where the two layers are always ensuring that there's no, there's no white or a gap between anything. And then, um, but you can always add three or four layers. And then what you'll do is you'll be testing different materials because again, some materials will succeed thinner while others won't. And by materials, I mean biomaterial, but of different formulas. Cool. Okay. So this is another example here where you can say this, the same kind of regionalization only the regions are a little bit more like aesthetically driven. So in this particular case, there was a design choice to have something be clear in this area and clear back over here where we wanted something that was, and this right here is actually very similar to the base biopolymer that we provided. And this region here, is actually fiber-based with, um, with biochar, almost similarly to what we, pre what we showed as the fiber example. And in this particular case, um, you can see how we also have the toolpath, the clear toolpath as we call it, printing slightly over and on top of the black. Um, you can see it kind of like deviating over here. And that was like another, or, and there's a clear bit that's running along this way. And that was all design decisions to add thickness while maintaining, because, and, but because it's a transparent um, biopolymer layer, you still didn't interrupt the black versus clear kind of like graphic aesthetic. Okay. Um, so this right here is like the actual toolpath and then the outcome on the right which you can see printing here, where in this particular case, um, it's actually taking kind of like the same method as what was happening over in the previous example, where it's like a lot of like small patching back and forth. So uh, in this case, like in these, I wonder if I can actually draw on this, but oh no, it stops it. Um, but in this case, you'll see that the clear is actually coming up on top of and over the previous horizontal layer, and that's helping like build up material. So in those particular regions, it's like more like a two and a half D print, we could call it. One thing I wanted to bring up uh, from that last video, because it was a good example of it, yep. is we got a question in the chat about retractions. And I was saying that uh, they're not really feasible with this style of printing. And so you can see those travels kind of moving across the open area in the middle. Um, just because there's a big, we're going to go over the extruders a little bit more later, but there's a big plunger at the top that's pushing the, the gel down through the nozzle. So there basically has to be a certain amount of pressure built up for that to happen. Um, so it's just going to keep, if you, if you turn off the extruder and, and like, you can try to back it off a little bit, but it's going to keep oozing out for a while. So you're going to get a straight line somewhere. So what's best is basically just to try to, in the toolpath, minimize those travels. So you can see that it's going to go 
through the middle there, but then later on, those are going to get covered up by more tool paths and you won't really notice those. Yeah. And actually, um, what Andy's making is a great point and you can see it on the left-hand side in the actual proposed tool path. It's these long lines where it is moving from one end to another to start to the next point. And that is because this is made of many, many curves. If it was a single curve, there would be no travel because it would just be moving from point to point. But in this case, like there's a curve and, and then it ends and another curve across. So the extruder has to move from, you know, point A to the, the end of curve one and to point B, which would be like, or sorry, the next one, which would be like the beginning of the next curve. Uh, and in this case, we did it in clear, so you wouldn't really see it in the end, but it did also happen in black. And that's a, that's a great point, Andy. Yeah. Um, and I do want to point out one thing, when, especially when you go to the hardware, we're just using this type. Um, if you had a auger at the end, which you'll see in a lot of ceramic printers, there's actually a second motor that's at the very end of the tip. You would be able to do retractions because that allows for high precision, in which case the retractions are just the motor going into reverse <laughs> so that the material gets kind of sucked back up and the pressure gets reversed as opposed to the pressure that's pushing outward to extrude. And in that end, in the grasshopper definition we're showing, we're going to be showing IO outs. If you are in a, you have a particular case where you're attempting to do re retraction where you'd want IOs or something to control the direction, IOs are the, um, the input and output signals that would signal like to go forward or backwards, let's say. Um, that's something we can talk about then. Okay, and I wanted to point out there is a, we have, um, when we're doing this workshop, we realized we should have sent out a survey and got like a good idea of kind of how much experience everybody has in grasshopper and in <laughs> materials or extrusion in general. So I wanted to show you, um, and this is included in that Rhino file, that complex two and a half D motions, similar to how you just saw the clear partially print on top of the black and then come back again are completely achievable even outside of Grasshopper as a means to producing these toolpaths. And this can be done manually. Um, I provided, like, here's the example from that screenshot. The only difference is for some reason, uh, this is black instead of green. Sorry, it's a different kind of screenshot, but otherwise they're the same. So you could see that while it, you know, it's a little bit potentially tedious at first, um, the logic here is that well, you can produce tool paths. I'm just kind of like simplifying this. Let's say the black here, the black path is all flat because it's against kind of like it's the first layer. The second path, where it doesn't overlap the first path, stays along the, let's say the print bed plane. So it's planar to the black, but it jumps up and over four millimeters to account for what will become the four millimeter thick first layer. It's more like three millimeters, but it, it doesn't hurt to like try a couple. Like I think in this case, we just kept it at four millimeters and works fine. And the reason you see it as it is, is because wherever it's overlapping the black, it stays four millimeters higher and then drops down kind of just like at a slant to reach zones that are not over the black. Once you produce one unit, which is in this case is this single, these two, you can duplicate them across an entire field and produce like a whole swatch of a two and a half D kind of textures. And so for those who are just starting and kind of like don't want to necessarily, you know, want to spend, you want to spend a little more time on like just like the printing process as opposed to the complexity of the tool path, I would suggest like just considering producing like a two and a half D or three D some module and then reproducing and copying that module over onto itself. And so that's why this exists here. And the reason that we're doing it this way is because um, we're going to take a five minute break in a minute. And when we come back, um, we're going to look at an alternative method that Andy has to produce curves from an image. But at the end of the day, everything that we're doing is going to just be the toolpath as a curve. And then that curve will be broken into waypoints later. So it doesn't matter how you make the curve, tracing, uh, producing it through offsets, using a script from any other kind of program, or just manually doing it to and a half D, all of it still yields the same type of polyline curve 
um, that we'll import into the Grasshopper toolpath creation. So from there, uh, this is just a side view. I think in this case, I, obviously this is labeled as three millimeter spacing, so that might be what it is. The difference between four and three millimeter spacing is determined by testing. These were tests that we did for our own machine where we think four millimeters works, um, but the, it doesn't even matter if you do three millimeters horizontally too. Um, it just depends on like how fast you extrude material. Um, so for anyone who's used a 3D extruder, that kind of like, if you have it pumping out a ton of material, your bead is gonna be really thick. If you have it pumping out less material, you're gonna, your bead's gonna be thinner. And usually, and we can toggle that in the grasshopper definition. So um, it'll it'll just take a little testing to get that perfect, depending on your own apparatus. And then just concluding here, anything that we don't talk about today, this is the support session I was talking about. Um, I we, it would be really great if after today, if you have a specific issue that you're interested in, um, you let us know right away so we can kind of prepare for that support session. Otherwise, you can submit questions or issues that you have. Um, just letting us know by email would be great. Um, or you can put and, and put some images on the Miro board so we know to reference what you're having problems with. Um, if you could do that by uh, Tuesday morning, that would be great to give us time to try to prep for Wednesday. But if you know earlier, that's even better. OK, I'm going to stop sharing. Let's take a five minute break. And at 11 AM, um, Andy's going to move into our first Grasshopper review. Cool. Um, before we go, though, is any, does anyone have any questions that have been answered? Great. All right. We will see you at 11. See you at 11.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Andy, when you have the opportunity, you can go ahead and uh, take it away. I think you should have access to screen share, but let me know if you don't. Okay. Yeah, I'm just getting my windows set up really quick. Yep. No problem. Making sure that that script is reloaded. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna kind of do like a little side, but oh, uh, screen sharing is still disabled. Oh, okay, let me take a look at that. Paul, do you know what? Um, screen sharing is disabled. That shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. What's your, uh... Andy, we're going to fix it. Just give a second. Um, in the meantime, anybody that wants to follow along, if you uh, haven't downloaded the Grasshopper script yet, Make sure to do that now and get it open because it'll it'll just be a lot easier to follow along with uh, the different parts of the scripts if you've got it open. All right, Andy, you should have yeah. it access now. I see it. Okay. So um, if any of you haven't used Grasshopper before, uh, in Rhino, this is pretty typical of what you're gonna you're gonna get. Um, I just have the window side by side. You've got your regular Rhino workspace um, as the window and the grasshopper is gonna open up as a second window and you're gonna see your whole script and you're gonna have the nodes that you can access. So to start off with the, the way that this script works is it takes an image, breaks down the image into four colors and then turns those colors into line work so that you can print uh, each of those out. So it kind of breaks everything up in regions. You can define what colors you want it to pick out of the image. Um, and then it will find it'll basically go through every pixel and say, of these four colors, which pixel is or which color is closest to the color of this pixel. And then it'll kind of group them into different zones that you can assign different uh, line patterns to and then use that for printing. So Andy, I want to just, um, for anyone who is not understanding like why um, there's a red box and kind of like a surface there, um, these these um, Rhino files that we're using right now will all make sense sort of like when we're done at the end of the day, I hope. <laughs> but this is the um, template setup that we have for the Prusa desktop 3D printer that we have an extruder attached to. So for anyone who is interested in having us print some samples for them, uh, you'll be using the extent of the surface as it appears in this file. For anyone else who has their own setup, your extent will change, and Andy will go into that in detail later. And if you're using a robot, you have a much larger workspace, and you can expand this to whatever size and scale you need to do. Sorry about that, Andy. I just felt like I didn't. I never gave an intro to what, what they're looking at. <laughs> yeah, no problem, no problem. And, and I guess uh, one more quick thing is just... Um, this red line is the bed of the, the full bed of the Prusa itself, but because we are strapping a nozzle off to the side of the extruder, it basically creates an offset. So uh, you're gonna lose a little bit of the available area. So this the gray surface is the extent that you can use with the, the nozzle mount as we've designed it so far. Um, so that, available surface. Uh, we're plugging in here first as our as our work surface. 
And then we're going to set each of the four colors that we want to pick out of the image. And so right now, there initially this was this was being used on a robot. So it's like a, a larger scale print and the prints were more square. So right now in the script, there's a little bit of a mapping issue that we're going to work on and then we'll resend it to update it. But for now, you can still see how the uh, script is working. You can see how it breaks down the, the images. So the main things you're going to put in are your image and those uh, four colors. So each of those colors is going to kind of work as its own uh, set of line work. So you can pick your colors and you can uh, by choosing hatch type, angle, uh, scale, and we'll get to extension later. You can uh, basically define how that color is going to work in the print. The other thing that you want to set up is the image. The, to change an image, you can double click it, go to file path down here. And then if you click these three dots, you can browse your computer and pick an image. And just as a quick example, this was like a four color gradient dot. So you can see that like, as it goes through the gradient, you're gonna get different edges um, because it's filtering out color, it's filtering out each color into one of four set colors. Um, that algorithm is called color distance. We can get into it more a little bit if anybody's super interested, but it's already kind of in here and you can use it without needing to know all of the, the details about it. So once we set our four colors, we set our image. We wanna make sure to hit play. Um, it gets heavier here at the end because each type of color needs to go through kind of all of this process. So we don't want any time we make a small change for it to change the entire uh, script and, and have it take a really long time. So this is a way to kind of block that, that off. It's a data dam. So we hit play. And there shouldn't be any changes now because I, I just opened the file and I haven't changed anything yet. But basically what we're doing is um, we're turning the surface into a, into a mesh with a bunch of little squares. And each of those little squares is being checked against the like what the color is in the in the image. And then that gets broken down into these zones, if I can find the right. So you can see this is calling out all the, that uh, all of this area is this one color and should be treated as a continuous area with this line work. And then that's going to give us the, whenever you click on something in Grasshopper to preview it, it's going to highlight that uh, that part of the script in green, whatever's coming out at that point. So this is just a preview. And this is our line work that is space for the nozzle. Um, one of the, the ways that the script works is rather than by manually or going through and drawing each line through that zone, uh, we're applying a hatch. So that way it can we can quickly kind of uh, change our patterns if we want or change rotation very, very easily. And that's all done again back here, lined up with each color. Um, so for example, this is color number one. We can change the angle. And now you can see that this is, uh, those lines are rotated. We can change hash scale. Um, this is basically how you're going to set the distance between lines like uh, Garrett was talking about earlier. Um, it's not going to be specifically one-to-one, -one, uh, like hash scale five is going to be five millimeters. Uh, that's dependent on kind of the spacing in the hatches that you use. So. What's going to be best is if you just kind of uh, pick the hash scale or kind of go through the hash scale and 
you can, if you need to, measure out the distance. And so right now this is like uh, 3.1 millimeters. And so if we wanted them to be spaced out a little bit more, you can just go back. Six, but I went too far. Um, but yeah, basically you can just kind of fine tune the scale. And once you know how wide it needs to be for your scale and what you want the distance to be between lines, then you can just kind of keep it there. So 4.5, uh, so six works pretty well for us. So I'm gonna update all of these. And you're gonna see that now the lines are spaced out more. It's, it's also gonna kind of change the fidelity at which you're printing from the basic image. Um, I think more, this just as a starting image is, is to make kind of the relationship between each line and each color more clear. But if we go to a more complex image, um, this is an example of just a previous work that I did that has like very clear um, differences in color from the green, the purple, the blue and the white. You can see that all of those colors from this image um, are being pulled out and then pulled into their own little hatch patterns. Um, and it's a lot easier to see in this why we might want the extension slider here. So one of the things is that in most images, uh, unless they're kind of very clean geometric images, you're going to have a lot of little pixels that get called out and, and, and pulled out, uh, making a bunch of really short lines in the middle of your print that are going to really increase the number of those travels that we were talking about. And so there's a filter right here. And this is basically saying that if any line is shorter than this filter, just exclude it so that we don't get all of these little dots everywhere. Um, but what that means is that in very complex images or complex areas of the image, we're gonna lose a lot of, uh, we might lose some line work or things like that. So the extension allows us to start to make certain lines longer uh, based on color. You, you can start to develop like a hierarchy and, and have certain colors uh, overlap onto others and, and bleed out and start to fill in some of those gaps. And what you're going to get at the end of it is you're going to get of uh, for each color, you're going to get one set of curves. And that's going to allow you to just kind of group them off. You can choose to use certain curves, leave certain ones, leave certain colors out as holes and um, work with uh, work with your image that way. And so each of these groups of curves can be kind of uh, put together at the end when we go over putting the putting all your lines together in one continuous toolpath. And so this is just to give you a little bit more freedom in how you're processing that image and how you're using each of the lines and each of the colors. Um, are there any questions? Uh, can you please explain uh, how you use, uh, you have two nodes uh, with Python. Can you please explain how you use them? Okay. So in this one, uh, this node is basically getting the UVs from the mesh. So the UVs are basically coordinates along a surface um, that you're putting image data and stuff like that onto like for texturing. And there isn't a good node in Grasshopper 
uh, for doing that. There might be some plugin that I don't know about, but basically all this that this one is doing is taking your mesh and then getting the texture coordinates from that mesh and spitting it out as UVs that you can use otherwise elsewhere in the script. And so we'll just go click in that. And then the second one, this is the one that is basically filtering through and snapping your colors. Um, it's using a type of logic called color distance. So colors are most often represented in your computer as R, G, and B values, uh, same as how you're putting the colors in at the beginning. Uh, and what that means is that we can basically also treat them as X, Y, Z points. So what I'm doing is for each color that gets passed in, I'm checking uh, for each pixel that, that gets uh, tested by the image sampler, I'm checking against all four of the colors that I've selected and finding out which of those four colors the pixel is closest to, and then basically setting that pixel to be that color. So you're, uh, it, it's basically the same as if you were if you were checking the distance between two points in space, but instead of X, Y, Z, they are RGB values. And so that's how you get the image from being a full color image to um, simplify down to just whatever four colors you pick. And so that, that's why it's best to pick colors that you feel are kind of dominant in the original image, because otherwise what you get is maybe um, if I picked a color that wasn't really in the image, you're going to get kind of a weird mishmash of some of the some of the zones that are already there. Are there any other questions about uh, using the script? But one thing I want to point out too is that uh, something that uh, you're going to see in all of the Grasshopper scripts today is that anything that you need to interact with is going to be boxed out in purple, and like, and everything else is something that you can. Oh, these should not be purple. Anything else is something that you can. Uh, you can work with. It's there for you if you want to pick it apart and play with it and do other stuff. But if you don't have that much experience in Grasshopper and you just want to get some of these scripts running, all you need to be concerned with is the uh, is the purple stuff. So your colors, your hatch spacing, your image, and then making sure that you keep, if you make any updates to the left of this play button, you pass information to the right of it. Okay, great. I have a feeling that after we get through the whole workflow, there might be like questions a little bit more about like how this all ties together and different ways to utilize some of these tools. But mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, this is great. And so this is like a, essentially just to reframe this, this is a method for essentially translating using images to set up a workflow where you could try different iterations more quickly by just substituting out the image. Um, there's definitely ways to kind of like enhance this. If anyone's interested, there's methods of importing in images from files. So you could theoretically set up a template for yourself where you have like a square template and you would set up like maybe four or five different images in a file and it would automatically import. And that would only replace the component that Andy has where you put your image. Just, you know, that way you kind of have something there, but it functions similarly. And uh, it's for the sole purpose of being able to start to explore very quickly with like multi regions and being able to use color as a means to start to delineate some areas that might use one material versus areas that might use another uh, or colors. But again, we're still resulting in a series of curves um, and then those curves will be output. Um, so to the, some of the questions that are coming up in chat. Um, 
that would be so the way that you would use this um is essentially like let, let me let, we'll go through this next um in terms of like what the next steps are about how curves are then translated into like waypoints and ultimately g-code or sorry target planes and then g-code um but yes ultimately you could use this where each output color is a different color material or or it's not uh, it's all the same material um and the same color and that you're using it to establish a different kind of texture um, topology across the sample that you're printing but in either case it provides a means for like more quickly um producing tool paths that are generated through images as opposed to ones that you would manually do however the end result is still curves <laughs> so however you get to curves is sort of like the option to get there um and then Mira is asking in the script the last color is giving an error why is that uh, it looks like for some reason the, the script is having trouble with the color yellow. Um, I'll have to take a look at that. But if if you're going off of R, G, and B values, uh, that's one of the reasons I, I picked the just like uh, primary colors in that that uh, script to show it more easily. Um, but yellow in to a computer is G two fifty five. There's R0, G255, B255. So it's all the way up on the green and blue sliders. And for some reason, it's picking out all of the yellow as being green. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that and we can update that and send that back out. Um, and then it is also worth noting that whatever colors you use are just for sort of like creating regions. There is no correlation between the colors that you choose here and the colors that nest that need to be used when you print. In the next section, we'll assign like a color preview to sort of to, to somewhat simulate what's going to be anticipated, and that's where you could set colors for, let's say, screenshots or renders or things that you would want to use just to get an idea for what you're trying to make. Um, but ultimately. In the event that for this, in this case, that some of the colors have a little, are too close together, or let's say if yellow isn't reading right, all you need to do is just create a region, you know, alter the color. There's times where we'll produce like a color image map whose sole purpose is just to regionalize material types and has nothing to do with the colors we're actually using. We might just say red is all going to be structural, blue is going to be something else, you know, maybe it's like a semi membrane and, um, and then green could be like a, a full membrane flexibility. And it's just solely an internal way of mapping out the different regions and diagramming out what colors or what materials will go where. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that kind of plays into Wanda's question in chat. She said, uh, next step will be connect uh, each color in a single polyline. Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to connect, you are going to connect each color into a single polyline. And then you're going to take all four of, or all of those colors and then connect them like one color to the next based on the order that you want to print uh like garrett was talking about in the way that you're going to have your colors come out through your print or colors or different mixtures okay great i'm going to go ahead and switch over to my screen now okay And what we're looking at now is we're switching over to the folder that is labeled um, performative biopolymers toolpath creation. Uh, for ease at the moment, um, you will just use the corresponding Rhino file. However, at some point you can always con you can always sort of condense these into a single um, grasshopper definition. We just weren't wasn't sure exactly. Um, maybe the best way to communicate sort of like steps uh, in the way in the workflow. Also, however much like computing power <laughs> or whatever computer that you're using is, uh, you may want to keep these separate or not. All right, um, and for the question of how do you fill in a cartridge according to the color gradient you simulate, um, filling, in a, filling up a cartridge, um, it depends on your cartridge. If you have one, uh, like if you're, it's actually, it's a really good point. We can show you that. We'll, we'll dig up some images to make that a little bit clearer. 
later, but essentially most canisters are going to come with two ends. Um, there's an end that has kind of like your tool tip attached to it. And then there is an open end. What you'll do is you can generally, the biopolymer, especially when warm, is so viscous that you're able to just pour it into the amount that you want. What we do is we set up, and I'm going to go in this in a minute, we set up a gradient feature that basically represents our canister, allowing you to kind of like move the gradient in Grasshopper to simulate where certain materials will lie at what point during the like sequenced printing process. But during that period of time, um, or after you're done with that, you would refer to that sort of percentage and decide, okay, you need 25% of your canister this, material, 10% this, and then test the sequence from there. Um, but we can recircle back to that if that question still remains. Okay, so we, um, we set up this next section to be uh, less about efficiency of how you might actually write out a grasshopper definition solely, but for the purpose of comparison and then being able to show you ultimately four paths of printing at their fundamental levels. All of these things can be expanded upon. There's like no question about that. <laughs> and we can, and if anyone has a particular module or component of this that you're trying to make more sophisticated, that's definitely something that we can help uh, with during the support sessions. And let us know ahead of time so we can propose something. First thing I want to do is orient you to the, the file. So this, you should notice the same box for Prusa. Again, that's just work beds because these are the beds that we're going to be using. Now, we wanted to show some fundamental examples of not only what it is to print on a planer, but to print planer with multiple curves and also to print in 3D, like as a 3D bed, like a non-planer 3D bed in single and multiple curves. And that's kind of how this is structured. So you'll see in red, the print bed boundary that is again, solely just for our printer, the Prusa we're gonna be using for this you know, demonstration on the workshop but it would change based on your own um, setup. Now, what we have here under 3D print bed, that is actually a, a 3D print that uh, we have. So if you wanted to try uh, to have us demonstrate one of your tests on sort of like this three-dimensional surface, you would use this surface as this is the exact surface that we have um, for non-planar printing on our extruder at the moment. You would, in the instance of whatever your own setup is, would be able to create this in your own way. For this example, we're doing non-planar printing on a flat surface of a substrate. It would be your choice how thick you want to build things up later. And in every instance, if you have a robot, this surface could be like almost <laughs> this. You'd be able to access like a much like like deeper, longer sort of a or larger, more complex form. Um, we're keeping it fairly simple because the ideas are will will still work and translate to any other subsurface that you do later. Now, in addition to that, we have some sample tool paths. I'm going to just turn off this bed for a second. Uh, I'm just referring to this is just going to be a simple planar example that we're providing. And then we have some 3D print bed curve samples that we're going to sh I'll show in just a minute. But that's essentially the layer organization. Um, I do want to point out that in this definition, when we use the, the 3D print bed, uh, we're only using the actual surface that you're printing on. We have included only the 3D bed that's in gray, just so that you have the actual surface that we have in case you want to demonstrate. But so um, just to be clear, when we later in the definition go to set the 3D print bed, I will be referring to the 3D print bed surface only. And that's why we have them separated in models. All right. Now, we have two primary tracks. Um, what we're going to cover, which is beginning here and ending here, is how to take wherever, whatever your curves were and inputting them in and transferring them or translating them into points. So I would say basically like one, like we could just Again, whatever version of your curve is, that's here, curves, okay? Now, that curves, they go in, they're going to go into here and here. Whether or not they are planar or non-planar just depends on um, whether or not you're going to be working in this upper kind of like region or the lower region. 
Now we have a branching structure. So what you're going to see is that you'll see a sort of like dividing point that happens between the middle of some of these. Um, I'm going to draw this in red here. This division point happens in the middle along the horizontal line. And the reason this is this is is because at this particular juncture in the um, in the file, there's a, an entirely more complex operation for multi-material or sorry, multi-curves, which is everything that's up in this upper zone. Whereas if you're only using a single curve, you get to bypass almost all of that with the exception of just like one little node before the branches converge back again at the end. And this is truly so that you can compare the difference of complexity of what's required for multiple curves or single curves. That is the same organization under the non-planar toolpath region. It's only worth mentioning that the reason these are spaced out as they are is because the two of these things also relate vertically um, so that you understand the difference between planar and non-planar. You can, you should be able to control, you should be able to kind of like look at exactly what's different. So you'll see here, for example, that these two component modules are almost identical. And then for the non-planar, the difference exists in this little section here. Same should be true later. You know, you is a direct to direct comparison. This is all the same, all the same. But over in this region, this would be an example of how in the planar toolpath, there's a fairly simple module solution. That module solution needs to expand to account for some different variables, which is what the non-planar toolpath uh, requires down below. I'm hoping that this layout will allow anyone who isn't familiar with this process to more easily track the differences between planar, non-planar, single curves, and multiple curves in each of those categories so that you can learn how to expand out any of these like particular sections for your own particular needs. So that said, uh, it's worth noting that our tool, the, the logic behind our workflows is always modular. Um, sorry, my like my full screen bar is like sitting right on top of my. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I like couldn't get to move my layers. Um, uh, it's worth noting that the reason that we've set this up the way we have is because we want to be able to articulate very clearly that the first section that we did was just producing curves. This middle section here is translating curves into the actual like arrangement of planes and information like IOs that need to come out for the toolpath. And then as the final module, the output, which is clearly delineated by these like purple zones that are labeled um, here, will result in a target plane, uh, IO and target planes. Those are what gets fed into the final component that will translate those that information into G code, which will appear in this panel when we get to that point to export. So there are three steps, essentially, creation of the curves, curves to toolpaths, and then, or, or sorry, curves to like target planes of the toolpath, and then toolpath, target planes, and information to G-code. So that said, I'm going to go over kind of like the logic of how this toolpath works. Um, oh, and it is also important to note, I like we, we label a lot in these components. Um, so when you're viewing these <laughs> displays, I would suggest that if you're used to only using icon view, like you're not going to see um, some of the labels, like for instance, uh, these points here, uh, you may want to, at least while you're learning what's going on, to change these to draw full names. Oh, no, sorry, that's not it. To uncheck, sorry, to uncheck draw icons. And you, there may be some information that's existing there that'll help you understand what's going on. So first and foremost, we're going to go ahead and this first section is about rebuilding the curves to best fit. There are many different ways of doing this, but I do not suggest taking a curve and just dividing it. The reason being that when you divide a curve, it's not taking into account any of the actual, um, the required distribution of points. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on here. Actually, here, I'm going to go ahead and turn on here. This is, I've set a single curve. This definition will be able to take both single curves and multiple curves. 
and it will make a distinction between what you've input and then decide between it. So I just, for now, taken a curve, set one curve, and it results in the points. Now you have two options here in the settings. The first will be kind of like the um, fit tolerance of a rebuild curve. The purpose of this is so that you can change kind of like the necessity of how many points and target points. Whatever points that you see here are gonna turn into the exact points that the um, extruder or robot needs to reach. High density of points is not ideal. And the reason is, is because when points are too close together, there are certain features like acceleration and deceleration and the way that it strings together these points that will cause like different performance uh, or differences in performance. One would be uh, whether or not the G code or the data is just so heavy that it trips up um, the operational computer. In some instances of robots, there's like a maximum give or take of like 5,000 location points within a single file before it becomes too heavy. Um, that might be one reason that you'd want to reduce it. And then another reason is just um, efficiency about whether or not we're actually utilizing the machine to round about corners efficiently. So what's cool about what we're doing here is that if you adjust this, you'll see that in many cases, the curve that's being rebuilt can be pretty accurately um, described with significantly fewer points. So in this, in this instance, I'm going to come up to the top view. This is referring very almost directly to the beginning of kind of like that first presentation where we talked about the fact that curves will need to be rebuilt into specific points. And when you rebuild those points, the machine is going to move in straight lines between those points. And so what you're seeing in red here when you preview this single curve point is the is the temporary reinterpretation of what that would look like when the machine runs through. Now, scale matters. We are, our files in millimeters, our printer isn't huge. We have a tendency when you're in like the vacuum of digital space to like zoom in infinitely and get like really caught up <laughs> in like the small details about whether or not like this, um, this tool path is matching perfectly our original target line. But knowing that there's four millimeters spacing between these two lines, we're talking about a deviation of something that's within like fractions of a millimeter. I would run tests, but generally speaking, though that level of detail is never actually translated when it's printed. It's in part because the gel is somewhat viscous and in other parts, it's just because so many layers are compressed next to each other that you don't actually read these straight lines. So in my personal opinion, uh, if this aesthetically looked okay, I would say even with this few of points and even with as faceted as it is, the actual outcome would probably look very similar to the initial blue line. The one exception would be a region like this, where you see a major deviation between the two. And that may be a reason to increase the resolution until that same area at least captures one point to represent the arc. Okay, now uh, the other only other option you have to do is choose between whether or not you're using a, a path that is curved or not. As you're gonna notice, unlike dividing the curve, using this setup actually only puts points where it's absolutely necessary to the geometry of the curve. It's not putting points equally around the curve from start to end. So in this particular case, it's important that we delineate whether or not it's there's more kinks or fewer kinks, because in this case, when it's taught or when the discontinuity component is looking for basically something based on tangency rather than curvature, from a tangency point of view, this is it only thinks it needs points at highly acute changes in the curve, like so in this case corners, um, as opposed to curvature which is looking, which is evaluating the curve uh, that you input based on curves. And I think like a really good example would be that if you were to, I should have moved over that example file, but if let's just say we were gonna use a curve like this, this would be a great example when you set this curve of using 
the tangency as it's only grabbing points where you need here because you don't need points in between because the robot or the gantry is already going to move in a straight line between each point. So conceptually, I hope that's clear. Let me know if not, and we can revisit that. So I'm going to set this back in. OK. I'm only going into detail about these things because I would say, like, in terms of 3D printing, this is like, these are features that you really need to keep an eye on because those are the things that like make the difference between a curve working and not, let's just say. So I'm cool with kind of how it looks in terms of like how many points and their distribution. If you wanted to, you could do a list length calculation to see exactly how many points are there. But when you hover over, you can see there's 306 points. That's pretty good. Not bad. It's not like in the thousands and you can move on. Now, the next component here that's after rebuilding the curves for best fit points is sorting. And this is just to allow this definition to distinguish between whether or not it needs to calculate for multiple curves that need to be interconnected, or if the single curve is just ready to go. Ultimately, as we talked about, um, the, the tool path is just a series of location points. So theoretically, it doesn't matter what those points are, how they are, they just need to be strung together in a list where the order of points represents where um, the machine is going to move to. So in this case, I off to the side here, because by the way, it's not like uh, this definition isn't like uh, containing anything to the bed. So you are going to be responsible for making sure that, like, you know, you know that if you were to orient, if you are using the proofs of bed and you move your curve, hanging off, there will be an error unless, Andy, the G-code doesn't cut off any points offside the bed, right? No, it only does that for the plunge and retract because that's the only oh. thing that, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a way to do this, but um, anyway, so at the moment, just be conscientious of like where, if you're asking it to go beyond, it'll probably more than likely, the extruder will try to move to that point. If it's outside the ability, if it hits the maximums of the gantry, it'll stop. So you're gonna to have to be responsible for making sure that what is on the bed stays on the bed. It is very easy. And for anyone who's interested, we can show during the support session, the best way to just automate this so that any curve that's hanging off uh, would automatically be chopped off uh, to the extent of the bed. But that's why I can come down here and show you, let's say we had three totally distinct uh, curves. And this would be true for, let's say, the definition that Andy just showed, where what you're ending up with is a series of hundreds of hatch points, let's say, uh, where each one is individ individually a curve that's not joined to its adjacent curve. Now, you don't want to have to necessarily go through and like make the manual connections, um, because what's going to happen is when you set these three things in, what it doesn't understand or what, and by it, I mean, what the definition doesn't understand or is trying to understand is which is the start point and which is the end point. See, there's an end here and a start here. And if you do have multiple curves, what is the most efficient way to connect these together in the motion of the, of the um, extruder so that we're not like crossing more than necessary? So what this section of the definition does over here, which is labeled orders multiple curves to shortest string possible, is it uses an enemy, which is currently just a stand-in for Python, which could be done with any looping, C, sharp, whatever you want to use, if you want to use something other than an enemy. But it allows you to loop by having a loop start and a loop end. And it just feeds information back and forth until it runs out of the number of repeated steps necessary. Now what's here, which is titled connect is actually just a cluster. That cluster is what's doing the calculation. What it's calculating is first identifying the endpoints of all the curves, and then trying to find the most efficient means of connecting and ordering those curves. So when I take these three and I come up to the input and I set multiple instead of setting single, you will see that that loop has automatically identified the, the, the minimum distance of travel that would be necessary between these multiple curves. It will update as you move the curves, and you'll see that the order will actually change based on the way that you put these. So what's happening is it's not only just trying to find what the shortest value is, 
but it is flipping the curve and flipping the start and end of each curve to also make sure that it's connecting the closest end to the next closest end in a sequence. Now you can see that uh, it's fairly light. So that's why it's kind of happening like in real time, really fast. Uh, it would be even lighter if it was rewritten in Python, <laughs> but it does, it, it does perform its function quite well. When you have thousands of curves, just be patient. Uh, it will say somewhere over here, I think at loop end, it'll say um, processing. And it's just because uh, it's going through thousands of iterations as opposed to only one, and it's running through grasshopper components. So it's just slightly, uh, there's going to be more lag than a, a direct script. But what you end up with actually is just multiple curves um, that have been ordered uh, by target point. So if you notice, actually, I'm going to come to here. What's output is not actually curves. It's the target points of each. And what results in is a list um, when you hover over it of what, whichever is zero, and there are numbered. So curve zero, which is up here on the right, because there's a number zero that's connecting to one, one ends to two, comes over to three. So you can you you understand the order. So you know this must be zero, one, and two. Has the first curve has three hundred points, three hundred three, then three hundred four points. Now, uh, the reason that you see curves at all is because we're rebuilding the curves at the end into a polyline. But the moment that we used the earlier portion of the script to break into points, we never go back to curves until the very, very end just for simulation purposes because the robot does not care. So now that we have our points, Uh, and by the way, because single curves are already all connected, this entire module is unnecessary for single line curves. You would come over, and what gets output, those points are assigned target planes. These target planes are essentially the way that and the location of however your like tool needs to learn how to go uh, and, and, and orient to. So what's happening, essentially, let me go ahead and put a, I'm going to preview these target planes and turn off these target points. Because we are working planar in this example, we know that all of our planes are going to be oriented to the world, X, Y, Z, just like you normally would have it. So when we zoom in, there should be no surprise that all of these points are X, Y, Z. Now, in robotics, using six axes or even things with like five axes, depending on where that fifth axis is, um, it will change how much of this plane is actually used, utilized for orientation. Like in our particular examples today, because we're doing the example on a Prusa, which is a three axis machine, there's gonna be the, the, just the center point is being used as a location, but we are providing planes for any person who needs to get more complicated because the plane will allow um, orientation on like crazy non-planar location points. But for the time being, that's why I have this as default is because in the instances of planar, there's no reason to do anything other than have an XYZ orientation. And finally, the last thing that happens is that because there are multiple curves, we want to put in travel paths. That's essentially choosing exactly how the robot will move or the extruder will move across as it's going from one to the next. There was an earlier question about retraction. This may be a location point at which you would decide to have the extruder rather than going forward hit this end point, go backwards, and then move. What you're previewing here is that in this section, the first and last plane from each curve is extracted. That's what's happening here. So you'll see these are the first and last that were already identified to the previous um, uh, block. And they are moved up in space a certain amount. That's what you'll see here. In this particular case, you're allowed to set your travel height. So this is just truly like exactly how much do you want the extruder to lift off and then move to the next location before lowering down and printing again. For our purposes here, the extruder is going to run from start to end. 
So it is going to leave a trail of material, as uh, Andy pointed out in the previous sort of uh, the example of the of the kind of extrusion continuing to go as it moves in that, that GIF. Um, if you have a system that has an auger at the end of your printer, that can be controlled to retract, in which case you could actually use this. Um, you could have it retract as it's moving up and then have no material be extruded until it lowers down into the next section using IO features. And I'm gonna get to that in a second. So to summarize here, all like basically this is doing is rebuilding the curve, deciding between whether or not there are there's one curve or multiple curves. If there are multiple curves, it's linking them together and producing assigning planes. And then those plane, the end, the end planes of each curve are being used to denote or to determine where to have a travel path put. So at the end, uh, the two branch back together because if you don't have a single curve, this line just doesn't pass data. So we come here to offsetting. This is purely to be able to automate a method for raising or lowering your first your print layer off the bed. This will be incredibly helpful if when you go to start printing, you find out that your material is like squishing out too much. You need to give it a little more height. Generally speaking, the first layer of prints is always a little bit less than the extrusion diameter. And then subsequent prints will generally be thicker. So I would say if you have a four and a half, if you have four millimeter spacing, I would guess that your first layer would be somewhere between two and three millimeters. And then after that, all other layers um, could be different, but, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so, okay, so we're cool. This just moves those target planes up and you're essentially done in terms of target planes. So this, this polyline that you see here is just reinterpreting these target planes. We do a polyline at the very end, just as a means to double check that everything that we did before is actually stringing together properly. You do not want to use a polyline in the beginning to determine the success of how you're designing the toolpath, because there could be some sort of component downstream that's that's actually not resulting in the sequence that you want. So here is actually what we use for um, the G-code. Uh, if not today, then we'll use it later. But and we produce a polyline just to make sure that it aesthetically looks proper. And you definitely know it's right because it's kind of faceted. All right. Now, essentially what we're getting is a list. That list is the is each target plane from start to finish. There's a component called um, tree statistics. Uh, oops. But I usually get to through stats, but mm, there we go. Tree statistics. If you've never used this before, what is cool about it is that this will give you some sort of like um, broad information about what's going on inside of the component in terms of its like tree structure. There are there's also like a visualization component. They all do the same thing. But all I want to get out of this is I'm double checking that there's only one path so that there's only like one list and there aren't multiple lists. And it gives us the total length of like the number of um, target points that there are inside of having these three connected, including the additional travel path planes. What the target, what the IO does, or what we need to supply it, uh, and what an IO does is it essentially tells through G code, something, whether it's the motor uh, to turn on and off, or it's maybe it's like a fan to turn on and off or heaters or whatever you would want. You usually need to supply a matching list to ensure that however many, I, however many target planes there are has a corresponding list of target planes. So in this case, we can double check you'll see that we have 911 and 911. 
what this is, is this is just a way that later down the line, each target plane is going to have, so if there's an X, a Y, a Z, it'll be in G code, and Andy will talk about that in a second. There may also be something, there'll also be additional items in the line like speed, extrusion rate, or IO. He's going to use this a little differently, but essentially we just have to make sure that we know that on plane, basically this reads that plane zero is being fed IO zero, plane one is one, and so on. So in this particular case, all we want to do is use the IO feature to create a start and stop of our extruder. So what you would do is you would create, you would take the list of target planes that's already done, measure the length of how many target planes there are, which we know is 911, duplicate one, which will signify that it's turned on. And this component, this here, I don't know if you've ever used this, but you can set expressions inside of a numerical values. So we have a list length of 911, feeding into the number of duplicates but under expression i have x subtract two and i do that because i'm adding in immediately after a zero at the beginning and end so that's why i take out two so it'll be like a zero a series of ones and then it'll conclude in zero at the end to turn off the extruder or any other device or any other um apparatus that you have using in conjunction with this. Now, this could be far more sophisticated. These lists could correspond to start and stops of retraction, for instance. It could be zero could represent forward, one could represent backwards, um, and other features like that. We're not going to be able to fully support for everybody um, exactly producing complex lists, but if you have a particular use case that of why you are here for this workshop, please let us know and we can assist through the support session um, and outside. But the logic is the same. So having gone through all that, uh, I'm hoping that it, you know, this is also gonna then make sense that when you have a single curve, there's no need to link together any points, which is why we bypass so much. So I'm gonna set this on its own curve. You'll see now this this portion of the module has just determined that there's more than or sorry there's less there's only one curve rather <laughs> so it's now going down this lower route and not passing information to the upper route because there's no need to reorganize there's nothing to do here other than assign planes and then pass it forward for the universal first layer offset and to produce the IOs. In this case, the number of target planes is only 307. So because this definition was written dynamically to take as many or as few points as possible, this IO list that's being produced, same deal, just uses the length, subtracts to adds a zero at the beginning and end, and produces a fully coordinated IO and target plane seek list. So I would say that's like the heart of it. I'm going to move on, but I want to make sure to non-planar but I wanna make sure that I address any questions if someone has any questions right out the gate about how conceptually this works or if there's a particular um, component you're not understanding. Cool, okay. So I'm going to take all this in and disable it. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, you can draw a marquee over an entire region come off the marquee, right click, and you can preview on or off or enable and disable. And this just helps like keep, um, I don't know, keep your, your computer processing at its minimum, if, especially if it's like a really heavy definition. So in this case, I'm selecting these and enabling our non-planar. I'm also gonna turn on our layers for the non-planar print bed and the gray print bed just for visualization. And I'm gonna turn on the curve samples that we have. So this version functions very similarly. The difference is that as it's currently set, before anything happens, we just need to project the curve down onto this like non-planar surface. So this first component here is gonna project. And because we are only gonna be using points that actually come in contact and are projected onto the surface, it actually is naturally gonna clip off any points 
that don't hit the surface. So in this particular case, you can see how I am just moving about this gray um, curve here. Honestly, I probably shouldn't have made everything gray. I'm gonna go ahead and make this a little bit more. Okay, so actually red was probably the worst, sorry. Since grasshopper does red. Okay, here we go, purple. All right, so I want this above, but it doesn't matter how far above or where, where above. It just matters that it's above. Unlike the first um, component, this is going to project. That means that in its current state, just to be foundational, this non-planar toolpath section will only work for one layer. And that is just for the sole purpose of like keeping it like simple. If you are particularly interested in non-planar toolpathing of multiple layers, we can build this out in a more complex way to be able to handle multiple layers stacked on top of each other. The primary difference is that um, because the surface is uneven, you don't just offset things in the Z up and down to make space. They actually have to expand out or contract based off of the normals of the surface topology. So as we go through this, I hope that'll come more clear, but um, I can always circle back. So first, same deal. We're setting either one curve or multiple curves. As I said, these two things are comparable. So you can, so most of these components are identical. So I'm not gonna go into them. The new component here is that we project and clip. Those points are passed forward and those become the points that we then determine whether or not like, we can establish um, the resolution through which we rebuild the curves. So I'm gonna go ahead and preview this multiple curve points. Um, I actually have multiple curves, or how do I word this? So even though we have one curve, because that curve is hanging off the bed, and because the points are being clipped, when the, when the curve is being clipped, it's actually resulting in now a series of many, many individual curves because they're not actually all joined and linked. So that's why in this definition here, when this piece, even though it's a single curve, is hanging off, it actually triggers the multiple curve route. If you contained or if you oriented this such that nothing hangs off as it is here, you'll see that it is still one curve and that's why it engages with the single curve route. <clears throat> so uh, we have our projection. We're going to enable whichever view we want to, to check out its points. So in this case, I, since, we're, since it's all on, it's gonna be single. Let's make sure that we have the right um, setting, which is particularly important when you're working on a 3D surface and resolution. Now, my only comment that's different than resolution as we already spoke is that you always wanna work kind of in 3D and just make sure that in the event that you don't have high enough resolution, that when points are going across each other, they're not actually moving through the bed. So in this case, I've like really, really reduced the number of points to demonstrate how not only just in top view does it become something that's highly too faceted, but you can see at this location here, because the machine is gonna move in a straight line from this point here to this point here, it does not acknowledge the fact that the topography actually lifts in this area. And that would cause a collision between the end nozzle of the extruder and the three-dimensional surface. So I like to do a quick visual check when I'm doing any of these tests to make sure things don't um, aren't intersecting in the event that you are um, really, really uncertain, you could just add more resolution to a point until it becomes impractical in its number of points. I would say that's too many points and this is somewhere better. Keeping in mind, we're still gonna have the first layer lifted off the bed. So we still have some tolerance of like, you know, two millimeters or so to not have to worry about collisions. So that's how I assess whether or not this is gonna work, which is only slightly different than what we did before. I'm gonna turn off these. All is the same. If you've got multiple curves, it's gonna do the same thing. As I said, the only difference 
in this particular case is that it's, I'm gonna set these two curves. Sorry, let me set multiple curves. You can see how it will not only do travel paths between the two curves that we did, but it's also doing the very short travel paths between each subsequent offset layer when it gets cut off. So in this case, we have a significant number of travel paths, um, but it doesn't matter because it's all being calculated and passed through. Now, the second big difference other than projection in the first case is that later in the definition, we were able to make the assumption that because it was all flat, we could raise everything up and down along just the world Z or the world plane. However, in this three-dimensional surface, we'll notice that if you were to take a normal, which by the way, a normal, for anyone who doesn't know, is if you were to measure a point, or let's say the um, a right perpendicular vector off of any one point on a curve, like in this case, if that's one curve and like, let's say there's something rounded, which is gonna represent kind of like where our topography is here. Normals on a flat planar surface um, would all be pointing upwards, no matter where you sampled from. But normals on a round surface, if it's perpendicular, would all radiate outward according to whichever whatever is perpendicular to the location on that curve. So because of that, we can't just use a universal Z like when we're working planar, we have to actually just test for uh, whatever the mesh normal is at that particular location. So this component here is essentially just identifying what, what the plane would be on that particular surface. And you can see here that our planes here are actually all oriented I'm going to go ahead and turn off these layers here. These planes are all oriented uh, uniquely to whatever their center point location is on the surface. So that when we make our universal path adjustment, our path adjustment, oh, I'm sorry, that's the travel path adjustment. When we make our universal first layer adjustment, it doesn't just move upwards, though it sort of looks like it is. It's actually moving along the normals at each individual location point. I'm gonna go ahead and just throw this over some humps so we can kind of see. Wow, it really looks like it's just going up and down. I know I did this, so it works. It's just weird because visually, I feel like you can't see anything. All right, I'll look into this, but and why it's not a little more apparent, but essentially it should be like expanding out and coming down. Although it might be, it's just like a really subtle surface. Anyway, doesn't matter. It's moving, so you'd set this at two. And we now are confident that there's an equal offset off the surface as opposed to like a universal move. And then all is the same when we output a curve. Um, I wanna point out one last thing. It does not matter when you're working with biopolymer gels to have multiple paths cross over each other on the same plane. There may be a buildup of material, but generally speaking, you can actually inject biopolymer into and through um, an existing layer that's already been that's been put down. There is not the same collision concerns as there is with like um, thermoplastics, where the plastic becomes hard before the path comes back to um, to print on it. In this particular case, the extruder will just like push through uh, the existing material. We've done it in the past where we've actually put two layers of clear, and then had another path come through and inject into the clear <laughs> additional color as a third layer, not just sitting on top as a third layer. And um, that 
conclude sort of like where we are in terms of like getting target points, because in both situations, whether it's planar or non-planar, we are still outputting a matching list of target points, sorry, target planes and um, IOs. Okay, is there any questions there? Andy, does it seem like there's anything I missed that you can think of? No, I think uh, I think it's it's you hit everything, and uh, it also looks to me like the offsetting wasn't looking like it was working just because the the surface is so yeah. subtle. Um, that's one issue that that we've had before, where if with this kind of printing, if your surface has too much slope to it. As it's mm -hmm. drying, it'll just kind of pull itself apart because it'll want to slide down. So these, uh, this 2.5D surface that we're putting on has very subtle rounded slopes to make sure that you can get some, you can get some uh, like 3D figuration without kind of running the risk of the print tearing itself apart. Yeah, totally. I was thinking um, it'd be easier for you to share your screen to pick up for the G code. Sure. And then meanwhile, I'm going to, there's a chat question uh, related to um, using an Ender 3D printer for non-planar geometries. Um, in the past, this individual's experience, the Z-axis moves slower than other axes as a result when reading the non-planar G-code. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So essentially what the question summarizes to is, um, so the way, that, the way that coordinated motion is achieved um, is different for every gantry, robot, and system. Um, conceptually what happens is that in order to make sure that you have motion in a proper point, let's say you have a three axis Cartesian um, system, that just means that it's gonna basically have, you have a motor for your X, your motor for your Y, Z, depending on, you may have a Prusa or not. So you may have two Z motors, but they are essentially doing the same thing. They're just moving kind of like the extruder up and down. Um, in order to have coordinated motion, it, the, you usually have to take whatever the slowest motor is or whatever the slowest um, rotational value is gonna be. And you make the other two motors slow down to it to ensure that all three motors are moving in a way that the, the, that the result is smooth and consistent. So what happens is that, um, let's say you're attempting to print something that is a straight line uh, or is planar, and it's just using the X and Y axes. It means that if you're trying to move like, um, let's say just one straight line in the X direction, only the X motor, really is the one that's moving. So it's gonna move really fast. If you're going diagonally, the X and Y motors, sorry, perfectly diagonally, the X and Y motors are actually fairly equal in their output. So they will move fairly quickly too, because they're both moving at like, let's just say the same rate um, to create that horizontal, or the, sorry, that diagonal line. Once you incorporate Z, you're adding the third axis. That third axis then becomes potentially the slowest axes to reach the next point. And that becomes uh, a time when you start getting conflicts with your speed. And more importantly, we're also adding a fourth axis um, when you alter your hardware, which is the extruder, that also needs to coordinate for speed. Some firmware and some like um, hardware systems are just designed to optimize for speed and they're just gonna perform better. Um, however, that's not saying that there may not be things in the G code that can be done to increase the speed of the Z axis. But if you think about traditional uses for desktop printers, generally you're spending more time doing like layers where the Z is just moving from layer to layer. It's not actually fully participating in like non-planar printing, which is why that these systems are not optimized for it. Um, I think that we experienced something very similar with the Prusa 2. Uh, and generally, we move into um, more high-end professional gantries, like a, um, a full bed CNC, 
or gantries that are designed for like um, CNC work where they're designed to be coordinated for speed to do non-planar work more continuously uh, in order to get the kind of speeds that you would be hoping for. Um, Victoria, does that answer your question? I mean, it's not an answer that's gonna be helpful, but there are just certain limitations to hardware that it's not because of that particular ender necessarily. It may just be um, because of the limitations and use cases for that machine. Yeah, and, and I think um, kind of also you can definitely do some testing to find out just how fast your Z can operate. Um, and that's going to have to be something you play around with. There is a specific code in the header that's going to set the maximum speed for um, each axis. And that's something, you know, you want to be kind of careful with it, but it's something you can slowly step up and see what your maximum is. And when we go over the, the part of the script that is specifically writing the G code, I can point out that line to you. Okay, great. Andy, I'm gonna, you take this away. We have about 45 minutes. So I think that should be enough to cover this and your hardware presentation. Yeah. Great. Okay, so this is, this is in the same script, right? This is off to the end and so, Basically, whichever you're using, non-planar or planar, you're going to connect that in right here to uh, the SARI inputs to pass that uh, curve along. Right now, I've got the 2.5D1 just shown as, a, um, as the example. The next thing you're going to do, and this is something I think we're going to... Uh, change as well. I, I think uh, I have often used a divide curve. Um, Garrett had pointed out that divide curve is not always the most optimal solution. So I think uh, we'll go through and, and I will set up the line a little bit more like he has been setting it up. But for now, this is basically, this print resolution is deciding the, the spacing between points on that curve. Um, so that way, and that's how you're gonna kind of limit the how faceted the curve is and, and how much detail you're getting out of it um, in this version. But we're I'm gonna I'm gonna change it to the best fit. Um, um, but the, Andy, just to clarify, we can we can actually just change this to just take the target planes, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that would be the most optimum. I think we'll just update it that. Okay. Um, and the next kind of chunk of information that we, that we want out of this is the full size of your print bed in X, Y, and Z. Um, so these are the numbers for the Prusa. Uh, and again, everything is going to be in millimeters. These are the numbers for the Prusa for now. So that's the big red square. And the next is X, Y, and Z offset. This is the offset of the nozzle that we're attaching from the kind of endpoint of the nozzle that's on the printer, right? Because the everything in the way that the printer controls motion is it's only concerned with the tip of its own nozzle. So since we're mounting something on the side, um, this is what that offset is measured out as. Uh, the only thing that is gonna change based on the way that our mount is is uh set up is z offset so you can slightly i know garrett has a uh slider in his section that controls z offset that maybe you could uh, think of that as like a fine tune and then this is specifically like what you're measuring it off of the uh um between the two the the distance between the two nozzles and of course, like in terms of the Z, it's up, right? So that, like if this is, uh, if you want this to be five millimeters up, for example, um, just to give you that extra space above the print bed for the, um, to lay the proper thickness of bead, that's what you're gonna set the, the Z offset is at here. Nozzle width is the next thing you're gonna put in. Right now, we're only using nozzle width for the um, for this kind of simulation and preview. 
because for the most part, you want to be accounting for nozzle width when you're making the tool path in the first place before you put it into either of these uh, of these scripts. Next is extrusion multiplier, and we're going to get into that. That's basically um, exactly how much of the material you're trying to pump out as it moves along. Uh, speed, we're going to be moving the print relatively slow. Uh, we're capping the speed at 20 millimeters per second to start off with because we want to make sure that the print head can is moving slow enough that the extruder can keep up with it. And then extrusion speed is, uh, that's going to be millimeters per minute. There's some differences in units in the, uh, in the way that G-code is written. And for some reason, extrusion speed is in millimeters per minute. Um, that's right now set at 5,000. So basically what we're trying to do is slow down the print head itself and speed up the extruder as much as we can so that those two can kind of meet in the middle. So once you've got those set, these two big old chunks are the plunge and retract. So you don't want to be starting your print, especially with uh, uh, this type of extrusion. The print needs a little bit of time to get flowing. So that's kind of where our plunge is. And it's, 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 this gives it time to get flowing and then get to our first position and start printing. The retract is what's going to be at the end. And let me just so that this isn't super heavy, I'm going to disable this. We're going to look at this as just the line. And we're going to look at the whole line. Um, our retract here at the end. Uh, we don't want it to keep just printing continue. Like we don't want it to just stop where it is because it's going to keep dripping material out. So we want to move it kind of up and out of the way a little bit. So that way you can get a paper towel under it, you know, pull your print off and make sure that you're not just dumping extra material on top. Um, like I said before, there's a certain amount of pressure that needs to build up in the tube and it's really hard to change that quickly. So that's going to be kind of the manual part where at the end of the print, you're going to come in and, and protect it from the extruder. Uh, so those are your plunge and retracts. And these sliders here basically set the height of the plunge and retracts. And I think I still have too much on because it's, uh, it's lagging when I try to move that slider. So we're just going to wait for it a second. But... Uh, Unless you think that you're going to get too close to the like the top of your buildable volume, longer is going to be better in this case. It's going to give it more time to um, start up the print. It's going to give it more time to move out of the way at the end, uh, more distance from your print. Let's see. Hmm. I have too much stuff open. It was not lagging like this earlier. But uh, yeah, for now, uh, those are the sliders that you're going to use for those. Um, the other thing was that we said before that anything in purple is going to be something that you need to interact with to set up your print. Anything in green on this area is going to be a preview box. So like these are directly um, things for you to look at so that you can evaluate both the print and kind of where it is. So this is the principal area. So you can kind of click that and make sure that you're inside of that, uh, that box. And then over to the right, there is a kind of a simulation of the print with a gradient. So you can control how that color is moving along the print and it'll show you the print um, according to the nozzle size. So you're gonna get the thickness of the bead and then the gradient is gonna be basically, you're gonna, it's gonna visualize the order that the, the points print along. And then it's also going to allow you to kind of set 
uh, and plan out how much of each material you want to add into the tube. And I can't um, Andy, while you're, while you're waiting for that to process, I, I was wondering, there, there's one thing I thought about to this question about the Z axis too. Tell me mm -hmm. if this makes sense. I'm also wondering, since the, since the desktop printers are using stepper motors, I'm curious if it's actually possible that the Z motor is trying to move too fast. So, uh, because the stepper motors, you know, like are powered, like the rotor is rotated through like um, magnetic, like attraction or repulsion in sequence. So there's not actually like a mechanical interlock. So it's potential that if the load on the Z axis exceeds what the magnets can like kind of force to rotate at the speed that it's trying to rotate, a stepper motor will just skip. Basically what happens is like the magnetic repulsion and attraction sequence will just keep going really fast, but not actually stay in any one spot long enough to cause the motor to rotate. So I'm just curious, like, you know, I don't, I don't know like what's going on, but I would say in addition to, uh, like we've had problems in the past where we have, we have tried to get a extruder to print using a stepper motor. And if we try to have the motor move too fast, the motor just sort of like will either make a weird kind of like clicking sound or a sound that sounds like it's seizing. <laughs> but what it's really just doing is it's just sort of like uh, rotating inside of itself or the magnets are rotating outside of itself and it's not really like engaging. Same with like sometimes it just doesn't look like it's moving, but it says that it's running. So there's a possibility that if it's trying to go a far distance in x y but a short distance in z it might be trying to go too fast i, I don't know it's just a pot there's a possibility that i think should be looked into if that's why the z is freezing up as just shuddering and freezing as describing yeah i mean i think th that was something that was happening with the uh the extruder right during testing um and that that definitely sounds plausible and then that that means that uh like you said before with synchronizing speeds you're going to have to dial down the speeds of everything else so that the Z axis can keep up. Uh, okay, so this is back now. So here we can just kind of, uh, this is our preview for our critical area, which uh, you guys are already pretty familiar with seeing. Oh, excuse me. Uh, this next batch is basically just going to take those um, uh, plunge and retracts and connect them together with the, the curve. And one reason why these plunge and retracts are so long is that we're basically checking against the uh, both the existing bed dimensions and our updated offset bed dimensions to make sure that we're never actually moving the printer uh, outside of its principal area. So it's, these are little uh, kind of safety features because if you tell the print, if you tell the printer to move the head three meters to the right, it's going to try to do that. And so like it'll it'll either make, just make a bad noise or it'll throw an error and it'll, sh and it'll shut itself down. Um, but basically in this, you want to be making sure that you're never you're never actually making a line outside the toolpath. Uh, for example, the non-planar toolpath that, that Gary showed, like that one does clip the print and make sure that you're staying within bounds. Um, but the planar one for now did not. And so like you, there, there is a possibility that you could tell the printer to go somewhere that it's not able to go, but it will try. And most of the time it's not gonna cause an issue. Um, but we just want to make sure that we're not running into those errors when they're preventable here. And then, so next, after connecting the plunge and retract and we've got our line where we want it and it's ready to go, we're gonna basically pump that into this Python node and we're gonna put out our G code. So you can see what it's taking is the series of points our extrusion multiplier that we set off to the side, our um, our speed, and then and this is the speed for um, x and y. Uh, in this one, I am not changing the z speed, but I will show you how to change that if you want. 
Uh, then we've got our Z offset, which is basically you know our height off of the off of the bottom of the the bed surface. And then we've got a spot in here to plug in that IO. It's not currently being used. If somebody wants to uh, start using IO, like maybe you have access to uh, one of those auger uh, auger ended print heads that uh, Garrett was talking about earlier, we can always kind of adapt this and help you out with that. My cat is being really annoying. Okay, so now we're gonna go into that Python note. And so there's basically three main kind of chunks to the G code script. And actually, if I zoom out, you can kind of see it over here. So the first main chunk is the header. And the header has a lot of these um, mostly like M commands. We're gonna get all, we're gonna go through a little bit of G code information later on. Uh, we're also going to link, there's, there was another workshop through Digital Futures that is entirely just about writing v coding Grasshopper. So we definitely don't have, yes, we definitely don't have the time to, to go through all of it, but uh, we're just going to give you kind of a basic intro to that. So all of this stuff in the header, uh, and you can see where I'm setting it here, is basically setting parameters for the print. Um, so. This first line, we're setting maximum acceleration. So the printer is always gonna kind of start off slow uh, when it's changing directions, and then it's gonna accelerate as much as it can. And this is this is setting those maximum accelerations. You don't really need to uh, change those so much. We're more considered with these prints about like capping the maximum speed um, because we never want the print head to outpace the extruder. So, here we're setting our maximum X and Y speed uh, in millimeters per second, and then the maximum feed rate. Uh, maximum feed rate, we don't need to change because this is still kind of, this is outside of where the, um, of where the extruder for us is kind of getting overpowered. So as long as we're setting the, the feed rates that we want, we don't really need to, we don't really need to, change this maximum uh, feed rate. Other stuff is going to be, you know, um, this is uh, retraction acceleration and things like that. You don't have to worry about changing these too much. The ones that you're more concerned with are kind of called out as variables already. And so those are the things that you can change outside of the script. Um, but we'll just kind of go through, there's the mesh bed leveling where it's going to test the bed and make sure that um, it can basically orient the print head itself to the plane of the of the bed surface. Nothing is ever a hundred percent flat or even, and so this is just kind of accounting for that. And this is something that the the Prusa does already. Many printers do. If yours doesn't, then you can just uh, take out this line, and that's something you'll look up on your own, and then. Um, setting units to millimeters. We are changing the extruder motor current because we're running a different extruder than uh, the printer is expecting. So uh, we need a little bit more power. Um, and then the rest, you don't have to worry about so much. And then here, uh, this is our first line in the G code file that is a G1 line. And those are going to be the most common. And this one is just to get us started off where we're just kind of priming the extruder. We're, we're telling it to uh, move forward a little bit. And then we're also setting an extrusion speed here that we don't change later on so that we don't, uh, um, or we don't touch later on. So it's always going to try to be extruding at that speed. Uh, there's the footer that goes on the end. The footer is basically just kind of all the safety features, um, turn off extruder, turn off heat bed, turn off all the fans, and then move up and away from the print. And uh, it's basically your kind of stop routine. Um, we're not turning on the extruder or the heat bed. 
but it's still good to have them in there just in case something was turned on. You don't want to just like walk away from your printer and have it sitting hot for like 24 hours or something without filament going through. And then, so the meat of the G code file is all of these G1 lines. And you can kind of see them off here on the right. I need to move this over here. And so most of them are G1 lines. And G1 lines are your move lines. So you can see, why is it scrolling? Yeah, I don't know what's going on with my computer today. It's running really, really slow. But uh, so you can see G1 is basically saying this is a move command. And then you've got your X, Y, and Z positions that it's trying to move to. And then the one that's that's kind of different and uh, is the E position. So basically, as your extruder keeps turning, it's it's basically keeping track of how much it's turned as a continuous distance. So every time we turn it, we need to take how much we want to turn and add that to whatever value it already was. So it's just it's a it's a value that's continually incrementing. And you can kind of think of this as the length of the print. So basically, when we take in those points, um, we're taking in the x, y, and z values. Here they're 0, 1, and 2 in that array. Um, and those are getting added in as the x, y, and z values here. And then for the uh, e value, we are taking the distance between the point that we're moving to and the point that we already are at. So we know how long of a movement that's going to be. Um, and then we are multiplying that by our extrusion multiplier. The extrusion multiplier is basically what we are playing with to make sure that we can get those synced up. It's another thing you have to kind of dial it in um, on regular 3D printers, those numbers are pretty well figured out by uh, the people writing the firmware and the people who are manufacturing filament for each of their materials. Those are kind of, um, that is kind of taken care of by the settings that you're going to use in a regular commercial slicer. For us, we have uh, extrusion multiplier that we're, we're dialing in. And this, this will allow you, if, if you're using a material that is maybe thicker, that you're having more trouble pumping out of the extruder, you can increase the, the multiplier here and kind of uh, account for that. And so now we are just uh, adding that on to our E value, which is continuously incrementing throughout the print, and then adding in that line uh, for adding in that G1 line for every point that we're trying to move to on the print. And then finally, we're just gonna come back and go through the footer and uh, add in all those safety features at the end. So, I'm gonna hit okay and get out of this. Yeah, and apologies again for the wait kind of in between these things. I, I really don't know why it's running so much more slowly right now. That could be it.
Okay, yeah, as soon as I close Photoshop, everything will start working better. All right, um, so the last thing in this file is the print preview. So this is gonna allow you to um, preview how your print is gonna run. And uh, like we were saying before, apply that gradient so that you understand, um, you can kind of visualize, okay, if I put this much of this material, this much of this material in the tube, how is that gonna look as it prints the line? So starting off, if we go down here, we can do position on curve. So right now, the curve, this slider goes from zero to one. Zero means that none of the points are being used. One means that all of the points are being used. So using that, we can kind of scroll through and watch the order that that print is gonna run up until that last retract. And then if I turn this on, this is going to turn that into a mesh pipe that is the thickness of your nozzle diameter. So that way you can make sure that, you know, you're getting kind of getting a little bit of good squish between those layers that you don't have any big holes. So for example, um, in this print, some of these smaller holes aren't really an issue. This would be an area to look out for. This would definitely be an area to look out for. Um, but a lot of these like really small little pockets, those are uh, definitely going to get smoothed out by the, the leveling and the material itself in the print process. But this will just kind of allow you to preview that. And it's also applying the gradient. So the gradient goes from dark, in this case, because you can just change out the colors, uh, the gradient goes from dark to light. And you can see it's starting here and it's going from dark to light. And this will all also give you a, um, this will also give you a mesh that you can basically use as a, um, as a preview or for visualizations if you wanted to do a render of this beforehand. And one grasshopper tip, if uh, you are not super experienced with grasshopper is since this slider is controlling that whole mesh and the, the order that it's printing, if I, like before when it was just a line, if I scroll this, it'll print. You can right click this, hit animate, and then you can set a number of frames and you can get a nice little visual of your print running. Oh, so this, I'm not, oh, I am actually sitting, no, that's fine. Um, this is running that uh, kind of animation. So this is the frames that you're gonna see spit out and the along the order that you're printing the, uh, the line. I don't want, that happen. Um, and then there was a question earlier uh, related to just like how you load the canister for colors. Um, that's something we're gonna actually do in person when we run test prints um, for sure during our last session. Um, but to this point, Andy, if you wouldn't mind hovering over the gradient again, I wanted to yeah. point out, so the gradient, um, basically all tubes come in different sizes. One of the ones that we're using is a thousand milliliters. Um, it actually comes out to be more like 800 millimeters that will fill the tube. What's interesting about this is that like, if you wanna be just quick and kind of like start to understand how much material you can put in, when you do this gradient, when you hover over actually each of the little dots and Andy, maybe you could just show how to add and remove colors in the gradient. I think it's actually the, yeah, it's there, or I think you don't even need to go into there. Um, if you just go into hover over one of the points, um, if you close this editor, just over the gradient, if you zoom into that slightly and hover over a point, you're gonna see a percentage. Um, like, yeah, maybe click on it. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. But you get, yeah, there you go. I don't know what just happened there, but you saw a 5%. Mm -hmm. or, Oh, you click and hold. That's what it is. Click and hold on the point, and you can get the actual percentage. There you go. 
All you have to do if once you can use this gradient actually as a means for quickly determining like how much material you want to load in the canister and where in the print that that would occur based on just using this simulation. So we know now that if you were to load whatever your total canister is, if you load 5% of that in the beginning with this dark, that will translate fairly closely with exact of where and how much material will be printed uh, of that particular color. So you may not want to use this as a full gradient. You may want to use it more as like only three color targets. And then that could translate to the number of different actual biopolymer materials or biopolymer colors that you plan to load into the single print if you are using a single canister as opposed to like a multi-material print head. So I just want to draw that like quick connection for anyone who's curious, like where, like how this simulation could be used um, beyond just for the means of like of uh, visualization. Yeah, and if you want to use other colors, like you could go into that menu that I was in before, or there's also a bunch of presets. You know, if it, if black and white or you know green to red makes it easier to visualize, you can always just change it however you want. And uh, looks like that animation that I didn't want to run is finished running. And uh, yeah, this is uh, this is going to be your preview to see what that what that line is going to look like kind of in 3D and with the proper thickness and with your materials. OK, so I think that's all there. Oh, most important thing. When you want to output your G code, you have to go over to this panel. And so I have it set right now to do stream contents. Uh, we can go over that in a second. But the, the easiest way to do this is you want to and you want to make sure you go copy data only. Uh, if you copy all content, you get some of the like formatting from Grasshopper that you don't want because your, your printer is not going to know what to do with that. But you do copy data only. And then now we're going to open up a text file. So on Windows, your basic text editor is Notepad. Um, I don't know where it is on Mac. Uh, and I don't remember what it is on Linux, if anybody's on that. But Notepad is going to be your basic text editor. You don't want to use Word or Google Docs. Those add, again, like more formatting into the text file. But now that we're here, we just we uh, copy and paste all of those lines. It might take a while because like there's a there's a good amount of points that you're passing in. So in each of those points is a line. Yeah, again, I think uh, in this one, I might have just a few too many points and we might wanna just take the planes directly into the cheat code. But uh, I can also show you, yeah, there we go. So this is our print. So all of these points are moves that your print is trying to accomplish. And then we've got our header at the top and you saw before that we've got our border at the bottom. Uh, you can see the, the points are moving. And then of course you've got the, the extrusion values that are continually incrementing along the print. And so we save this out. And when we do save as, I want to call it, um, first, we want to make sure we're not saving as a TXT file. We want to save it as all files. Uh, you can see earlier there was one, this guy right here, that I accidentally saved as a TXT. Uh, your 3D printer does not know what to do with TXT files. Uh, so you want the to name it whatever you want. So I'll just do test print one and then dot G code. The file type, um, the, the, the file name could vary. I would just see whatever your printer uses, but for 99% of printers, it's gonna be dot G code. And uh, so that is our file. 
we're going to save it out and then now that's ready to basically just put on an SD card or USB drive or whatever your printer takes and throw it on and test it out. The other way that you can do this um, that I like to do because sometimes I just forget to copy paste is there's this stream contents button. So that means that whenever this panel in Grasshopper updates, it will update a text file that you already have saved on your computer. Um, and so to do that, we're first going to pick a stream destination. So let's say we'll call this current test.gcode. And I'm going to save this to save that destination. So anytime. See. Anytime this runs, get oh wait, it's in the files folder. Oh, I have to make current test dot code. I forgot to do that. So here I'm going to go new. Plain text. So rich text means more formatted. We don't want that. We want plain text. And now I can edit this and make sure that it's current test.gcode. And it might become unusable. That's fine. We know what we're doing because we are purposely setting it to be a gcode file. And now I'm going to make sure that this is pointed properly towards that. Do you want to replace it? We want to replace it every single time that we run that panel. So now, um, well, it's not going to update until I change something. So let's disconnect. And so now that I've disconnected IO, you can see that this changed this panel. Um, it like refreshed very quickly. Okay. Try to refresh this again. There we go. I think uh, what it was is it didn't want to update it while my while I had it open in the text editor, so I needed to close it. But yeah, so now it's updated this, and it's giving us the newest file. If I change something, if I close this, change something in here, and then re-update it, uh, it will add a line that just says daily file now if i go back and i open that up again we see updated file up top so that's just another way to make sure that you're not uh you're not losing data if you're changing stuff around and you've always got the most up-to-date file in whatever uh, wherever you're telling it to put it. I'm going to take that out now. We don't need. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about putting out G code? There may be some questions that you have that are going to be answered during my next presentation. Um, and if so, I'll just, I'll let you know. 
So we are probably going to run over just a bit. Um, oh. we're continuing to keep things streaming. So everything will be should be available on YouTube. Um, so but Andy, you just like continue on. I just want to give everyone a heads up. So that's pretty much the last thing. But in case yeah. you have to go before Andy jumps on here, I just want to let you know, or just to reiterate, next session is sort of like one of the sessions we're going to use to sort of like the things that we're saying, like we're going to update some stuff and add things. We will re-upload new files, but we'll do like a quick review of those things um, during the session. And um, we're leaving the time where we're going to schedule the time for like individual appointments, but only if we are notified that you could use an individual appointment. Um, so if you could please just let us know by Tuesday night. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, by Tuesday. Um, well, if you just need an appointment just to kind of do it, you just want to like schedule one, well, we'll send it an email, but we need to know that by Tuesday night. If you have like a big topic, <laughs> like you want to know how like something more advanced in Grasshopper that may require us to sort of like build something out, please let us know as soon as possible. And we'll try to accommodate for however complex that kind of question is to answer it for you during the support session. Um, and if you, uh, but we'll be doing that on, I think it's Wednesday, right? Um, from 10 to two. Um, our following session after that, which will be our last one, we're going to be taking some samples that you have, if you have any, and we're gonna actually do the demonstration of loading it all and like getting a printer running and running the test samples. We'll have some multiple views. So you'll have like recorded data of kind of like your sample being printed if, uh, if we have too many samples, we'll kind of just have to do like a randomized pick. Um, but if we have enough time, we'll run through as many as possible. The only thing that we're going to say is that because the tube uses a thousand milliliters of material to load, um, and there's a little bit of time in terms of like loading and unloading, we're going to just load and then run print tests. Um, that may mean that you might not necessarily get the colors or the gradient because <laughs> we can't individually do each thing but we will at least be able to show you what your tool path looks like and how it would be extruded. So cool, great. Um, so thank you uh, for anyone uh, who has to go, but otherwise Andy is gonna be covering um, about some discussions regarding hardware. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And this is gonna be, I mean, this, this was, this is gonna be a very short presentation. So uh, basically since this is a large workshop and everybody is coming and everybody's coming into this with kind of a range of 3D printing knowledge and experience. We just wanted to give a quick introduction about uh, the basics that you kind of want to know for this. Um, so although there are a lot of different methods of 3D printing, like there's resin, there's powder base, there's, uh, you know, um, we're going to be focused on extrusion based 3D printing. And so these are kind of the most common for now um types of consumer desktop 3d printing and a lot because we are also extruding a material even if it's not uh like a melted a melted filament a lot of the ideas we're gonna kind of translate very well and we're also in the case of our demonstration using an extrusion based printer to handle the movement for us so uh, we're, there's a couple of different formats that you you can use for this, um, but uh, so we're just kind of go, go go over those formats a bit. The Cartesian grid system is by far the most common and accessible of the 3D printing formats. Um, this means that the printer has separate axes for. Can you guys see my mouse? Okay. Uh, yeah. This has separate axes for X. Y and Z. And the printing head is going to move along each of those axes to reach given points in space. Um, you saw that in the G code already. You saw it in uh, Garrett's presentation. The printer on the left is the Prusa Mark III. And that's the one that we're going to be using for our demonstrations. Um, I know I saw that in the chat that uh, Victoria had the Ender 3 that was already in there as an example of another. Um, very, very, very similar printer, um, much cheaper. And especially for the purposes of what we're doing, a lot of the things that are on the Prusa are basically to control filament flow. 
and we're not really concerned about those. So this is pretty much going to give you um, what you need as well for like a quarter of the price if you don't already have a 3D printer. Next step up from desktop 3D printers are CNC machines. So they're typically much larger and they're going to be a lot more powerful. So you can see here is uh, Paul and here is a paste extruder mounted directly onto the CNC. They work on the same XYZ system. And aside from the Grasshopper scripts that we're working with, there's a ton of Grasshopper plugins and standalone software made to send tools, uh, send tool paths to CNCs. Um, so you could, you know, in this case, you could use what we're giving, or there's like all kinds of resources out there. Um, they're definitely more expensive and they take up way more space by virtue of them being so much larger. But if you have access to one, maybe you have like a shared workshop or you're a student, they're another really good choice to use in the future. And finally, uh, robotic arms. Robotic arm, the, the, this is obviously the most expensive method to printing biopolymers. This is like a three meter long robot arm that needs its own full enclosure. Um, but many of you are students and robotics labs are becoming much more common at schools. Uh, and this is uh, just gonna be a way to print that uh, gives you a lot more opportunities. So uh, this is going to be using a the planes that uh, we we're talking about from, from Garrett's thing. Um, because the biggest difference between a robotic arm and a Cartesian or gantry-based system is that it includes also rotation, uh, and specifically the orientation of the print head at the target point. So this is going to give opportunities like printing directly along slope surfaces and being able to account for those kind of curves better. You could tilt to reach points that a vertical, like a vertically stuck print head maybe wouldn't normally be able to reach. Um, we're not going to really be able to go into too much about robotic printing because it does, it does definitely add some complexity. We've got some stuff um, like putting out the planes in the script already for you to kind of build off of if that's where you want to go. And beyond that, um, Here's a, a few resources. So there's a plugin specifically for dealing with robots. Uh, it's just called Robots. And this is a link to it from Food for Rhino. This is the GitHub page for robots. Um, GitHub is kind of like, for anybody that hasn't used it, it's kind of just a way for people to put up uh, mostly code, but oftentimes just anything that they make as like a collection of files. Um, and this GitHub is gonna have a lot more information on uh, some basic tutorials and things like that to get you up to speed. There's also a lot of stuff out there on YouTube if you're looking around. Okay, so we've had, the, so those first three were all to handle motion. And now we are trying to handle extrusion. So this, uh, I uh, uh, forgot to double check with you, but I'm, you guys were using the 3D Potter extruder, right, Garrett? Oh, you're sorry. You're... I sorry. I had a I had a pen tool on my annotation, and I couldn't. It wouldn't let me unmute. Um, I see. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we were asked that too in the chat. So some of them are 3D Potter, but there was also. Uh, I know at least a few years ago, there were quite a bit of like open source projects, Brian Sarah being one type for clay, um, mm -hmm. where they just, you you had access to like, um, basically it's, you know, just the stepper motor, the the worm gear, and then the, um, with some attachment to that gear that you could 3D print. And so I think in some of those images, there may have been a different one, but all similar. Okay, cool. Um... Yeah, so below each of these extruders, if you're trying to go out and get one or links to their like uh, pages, uh, they are expensive. Um, this one, especially like especially based on the size that you're 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 looking for, like this one right now, 
purchase the extruder is, is about uh, 1500 bucks. Uh, the Sarah extruder, like Kara had brought up, is an open source extruder. So you still need to find the motor and the worm gear, and there are certain parts that you need to buy, but all those are in kind of like a nice, neat shopping list for you. And as much as possible, this is built out of other kind of off the shelf components and 3D printed parts that uh, that you can make your own and save a lot of money. I don't know exactly how much this printer would cost right now to build it yourself, but it's definitely going to be much cheaper to do it this way. Um, and then last one, there's this kit from Stoneflower 3D that is designed to be mounted to smaller 3D printers and CNC's. Um, this kit itself, I think there's different levels of it. I think the cheapest one that they offer is about 700 bucks. And uh, that's another great option. It, they have really good documentation for kind of attaching this to a 3D printer. It's got all of the controllers and everything that you're gonna need to handle it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, there's always gonna, there's there's all kinds of ways that people have found to kind of extrude uh, paste out of another printer. I think I've, I've even seen people rig up uh, systems where they take those big syringes that uh, Garrett and Paul were showing in the demonstration and just have something that pushes on the back of that syringe to kind of keep it a smaller setup. So this is just a couple images of the, um, the demonstration set up in my apartment right now. We're gonna be filming it from Garrett and Paul's apartment because their lighting is much, much better than mine. Um, so since we have to hold such a large volume of liquid and it's a big extruder, it's, uh, the extruder itself is mounted securely to this metal rail. Uh, and that doesn't move because this printer does not have, and no desktop printer has the strength or stability to hold something like that on it. And so we're just running a hose that is clamped to the side of the extruder. And so the design for this um, hose clamp is gonna be made available to you guys if you want it. Um, if you're not using a Prusa, you'll have to adapt it, but you know you can kind of take a look at your printer chop off what you need to chop off, add on what you need to add on. Um, and this is basically designed to hold this end of the nozzle and then hold the hose to keep the hose tight and allow you to adjust vertically and get the tip of this printer in, in line as best you can with the tip of the nozzle itself. And uh, yeah, so I think that's it for that. Oh, also, it having this long hose also means that the um, the need to build up back pressure and then also like having to kind of fight against that back pressure does get a little bit worse with this, but there's not really much you can do otherwise. So this for anybody that is very like electronically tinkering inclined is kind of a hardware diagram on how to connect the stepper motor that is on the paste extruder to the Prusa itself. And sort of uh, the connections that you need, these are the drivers, like basically on the board for the, uh, for the 3D printer, you're gonna have like a plug for each of your stepper motors to plug into. And that plug is a driver that is uh, basically controlling motion for it. It's like sending all of the commands to that motor. Um, and that is on the INZ board that is in the back of the PUSA. And this is basically, yeah, just a brief intro on how to connect that if you are so inclined. So I was saying I was gonna go over the specifics of G-code commands. So these are three examples. We've got a basic, uh, we've got a basic G command. So G commands are mostly commands that relate to moving the head. Um, so this is an example of one that 
uh, it's called G21, and it just means set units to millimeters so that the printer knows that any points that go that are sent to it should be read in millimeters. Um, then we've got our G1 move command, and then we've got an M302 command. M commands are, there's way more M commands than G commands. Uh, and these all have to do with parameters that are specific to the printer themselves. Um, most of the time, like when you're scrolling through your, uh, like a desktop printer and you're going through the menus and like telling it to do stuff, basically what you, like those options that you're picking are giving the printer these M commands. And the printer itself is basically spitting back to you what it's getting out of them or um, showing you that it's made those changes. But you can also run these in your G code file. Um, every G code file usually has a couple, and we're using some extras because we're trying to do some kind of trickery with the machine. For example, this M302 that allows for cold extrusion. Normally, your printer won't want to do that, but uh, this allows us to turn off that like safety feature. Not safety feature, but just to protect the printer from trying to extrude hard plastic. So next is a little guide. So anything in blue is the command itself. Anything in orange is a parameter that's passed to the command. Each of these commands takes different parameters. So it lets you send it different options, different information. Um, there are like 700 different commands. So no, we're not gonna be able to go through all of them, but I have a link at the end to a, uh, um, a set of documentation for all of that. If you are confused about any given command, you can look it up. It, it'll show you what it changes, what information it takes, um, if possible, what information it gives out. So anything in orange is going to be the parameter. So for example, in this one, M104 S215, S mean s is kind of the start of that parameter it's telling it what kind of information you're passing 215 is the information so that is the uh that's the temperature that you would be theoretically setting the hot end to anything after a semicolon if uh the printer reads everything line by line so anything on a line that's after a semicolon it's not going to read um, that's just there to make it more readable to you. Uh, I've added in comments a lot of lines that come out of a like a commercial uh, commercially prepared slicer. They will add in the comments. Um, so this is just good practices and this this lets you know what each line is doing. And finally, this is uh, I mean we already went through the G1 move, but uh, G1 is uh, is a move. Well, it's a linear move with extrusion. So most of your stuff is going to be G1 moves that are linear moves with extrusion. There's also G0, which is a move that does not include extrusion. Um, and this is what you would be doing for those travels and things like that in between retractions if it were viable. It's not really in our case, so we don't really have to... Um, no, well, we don't really have to use the G0 commands, but if someone wants to implement that IO uh, into the G code, that's basically what it would be doing is it would be switching between, is this running a G1 or is this running a G0 line? And then at the end here, and we're gonna make this available to you guys so that you can access all of these links and reference any of this if you need to. Um, first up is G code basics for 3D printing with Grasshopper. This was another past digital futures, uh, lecture done by Diego Garcia Cuevas. He also wrote a, like a full book on clay and other types of FDM printing using Grasshopper. It's a great book. If you really want to get more into it, I think it's like 30 bucks on Amazon. Um, there's another uh, G code tutorial. I like this one as well by Diego Pinochet. This is also on YouTube, Grasshopper for 3D printing. And then this is not so much a Grasshopper 
tutorial, but it's understanding G code in general. And I think at that, this guy is, is better. Uh, it's by CNC Kitchen on YouTube. He is like a professional 3D printer for all kinds of stuff. He really knows what he's talking about in the way a printer works. And he's going to get more into the nitty gritty on that. Um, I've also added in here the documentation for Marlin. Marlin is, especially right now, the like by far the most common 3D printer firmware. Most printer, Marlin is open source. So most printers run off of Marlin uh, firmware. And that means that they're using all of the G code commands that Marlin uh, makes. But uh, on top of Marlin, typically certain printers will have their own kind of their own commands added or certain commands disabled. That's the case for the Prusa. That's the case for the uh, Creality printers like the Ender 3. And uh, so you'll have to kind of go through and find any differences if you need. They're typically like really nitty gritty ones that uh, you're not going to have as much use for unless you're getting really deep into how your printer works. But uh, this is a great starting point for understanding more G-code or if you're going through the Grasshopper script that we sent and you don't understand what a line is for, you can go here, you type in that command and it will explain what the command does, what parameters it takes, all of that. And that is it. I kind of breezed through it pretty quick at the end there, but if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free. We have a chat question. Um, I am okay. apologize if I'm, I'm heavily mispronouncing your name. Monsieur, um, he is asking uh, about whether or not we have any familiarity with the, the Saram bot. Uh, there's a link. It looks pretty similar um, to the Brian Sarah and looking to hook it up and gonna see, give it a go first though. I guess um, a question, a follow-up question is what do you you know what what you mean by hooking it up like whether or not it's something that's controlled by g code or like hooking up um or hooking up this extruder to a different 3d printer um so if you wouldn't mind just responding to that uh and then well, and yeah, you I, happen I, to have... I bought... oh. i'm here yeah just I bought the extruder and I have a Delta type printer and yeah, like attaching it to the Delta type printer to be able to, to print stuff, either clay or biomaterials. I have some resources re regarding this extruder. I haven't got it into it yet, but that's more or less what I plan on doing. And I'll let you guys know how it goes. You know, we, like, especially when I was putting together this portfolio, we talked about Delta type printers and I was just saying like, oh, well, I, I don't see many people using them as much anymore, so I won't cover it. Uh, so that is definitely a hole in kind of the stuff we've gone through because as far as I know, the the G code, like the- um, Andy, the could you stop uh, sharing? Sorry, it's just a black screen for anyone on <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> um, from- what I understand, like the like Delta printers typically use different firmware with a different G code format. Um, I know that Marlin has some. Let me look that up. Marlin has some uh, Delta firmware stuff. Do you know what firmware your printer uses? Uh, I'm not sure. Like I bought it a while ago. I played with it. I've I I've plotted with it. Like I attached like a pen holder and plotted with it. But it's been like about like four or five months that I haven't touched it again. So I, I need to like revisit it. And but I do think it, it is compatible with with Marlin. If I'm not wrong, I have to look into it. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. I mean that would be. Crazy here, and that would definitely make it easy if it's already compatible with Marlin. I think, aside from that, uh, I'm well. I'm also glad that you've already made that pen mount because that means you're already kind of dealing with the geometry of the printhead, and yeah, um, 
because that's the kind of thing that is going to help you design how because I'm, I'm assuming it looks pretty i mean yeah i'm assuming that you're not going to be able to mount this directly or no there's like a little, there's a little I, I think uh, i think i found someone on instagram that did mount it on like the same delta printer that i have so yeah. it seems possible yeah okay that's great and if, if if they've already got one mounted on there then um that would be then that's great it shows it's very doable yeah it looks like you've got like a little almost like a like a like a little fat pen type of guy with a with a stepper motor off to the side so yeah, yeah i think uh, i think that's something we can definitely help you with i would i think some of the things that will help us on wednesday is if you could give us an example g code file that you've already made especially if it's one that you've used on that pen plotter because the uh that that you made with it um cool i could do that and then also if you have yeah if i think you if, if you if you have like a go at um making a mount like designing a mount to connect this i would definitely reach out to that guy also not everybody is going to want to share everything that they make but a lot of people are a lot of people like like this is all of this is pretty far into kind of like DIY people doing weird stuff space. And typically people are excited when other people want to do that too. So I would definitely reach out and ask them about it. Um, Andy, yeah. do you think um, having the exact kind of like model of the Delta printer and which of these extruders were told? Uh, definitely having a, having a specific model of the extruder, like you can kind of get away with, um, oh, you mean the model, not a 3D model? Yes. Having a specific, having the model name and like number for the printer and the extruder will be very helpful. Okay, will do. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. I'll, I'll get more into it and, and yeah, and let you guys know. Yeah. I mean, it definitely sounds like something we can, we can help you get moving. Feel free cool. to use the Miro board as a space that you can just upload pictures or whatever schematics, whatever you find on there. And that'll help um, Andy kind of review through it too when we look at it. Okay, will do. Thanks once again. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, nothing in chat. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I think if if any of you have any other questions between now and Wednesday, I think again try to message us as soon as possible. Like uh, in Mansur's uh, case, he's able to give us all this information. We can start looking that up and get it like get that much further during the help session because we're really not going to be able to devote that much time in that session to any one person. So I think this is about like front loading as much of that as possible before we go into that meeting. Yeah. And definitely like as you play around with uh, the grasshopper scripts or start to come up with your own tool path, I'm sure that people are going to have more questions then. Um, so try to reach out to us as soon as you run into those things. And we're going to um, send out, like, check your emails. What we'll do is we'll send out a, a link to a um, Google doc. Uh, a Google Sheet, rather, so you can sign up for individual time or, you know, at least let us know that you want to have an individual session. And then we can sort of like assign times after we hear back from everybody. And um, again, we just uh, it'll be like a first come first serve sort of situation. Um, but any other larger topics, let us know earlier. <laughs> OK, great. Well, Andy, I think that was great. Um, We'll make sure that all of this content is up just like last time. Uh, it'll be accessible through YouTube and then, of course, like through the drive. Um, when we upload updated files, they will have updated dates so that there's no confusion about which file you already have. And it'll be in the same format of packaged into folders. Um, please feel free to alter the definitions to your own needs to try to do whatever you want. I think the best case would be that for the next sessions, 
um, you try you try something out, and then we can help you th through some of the troubleshooting, even if that means um, deviating slightly from what what the definitions modules already are. Uh, if you want to try to build out whatever you're trying to do for your own system, it would be a perfect opportunity for us to kind of point you in the right direction if we can't solve it right on the spot. And even if you don't know what exactly you want, or like how to get a module working, like if you kind of outline it and like add in some filler blocks and say like, this spot should be trying to do this to the points, um, that helps a lot. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will see everybody uh, on Wednesday. Yeah, thanks. Thanks All for right. attending. Been a fun workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.